Thank you, everyone, for coming to the Federal Reserve Bank of New York today for the start of the Central Bank Research Association 2023 annual meeting. I am Linda Goldberg. I'm from here at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, and I'm here to welcome you on our behalf. I'm also chair of the Americas chapter of CEBRA, and like many of you, I'm an active researcher, and I'm deeply interested in important and policy-relevant uh, questions. So from the New York Fed's perspective, we're happy to host uh, CEBRA on this first day of the three-day program and to embrace the mission of CEBRA. CEBRA is an independent scientific organization. It's open to academic academics and practitioners working on topics of interest to central banks, financial regulators, international financial institutions, and fiscal authorities. CEBRA's mission is to encourage implied, applied and theoretical research on topics relevant for these institutions, as well as to connect all of you, uh, the research staff from across these institutions, with academia. And my understanding, and Raphael might um, correct me on this or, or expand on this, but currently CEBRA connects researchers from around 60 central banks, international financial institutions, and academic institutions. So I really want to applaud um, all of you for the type of work you're doing and for the connections with you, that you make with our staff uh, at the New York Fed today and with each other over the next days because those connections, having those connections, using them is consistent with our mission too. Um, that is, what's the mission? To make the U.S. economy stronger and the financial system more stable for all segments of society. And we try hard to do this by executing monetary policy, providing financial services, supervising banks, and importantly, providing thought leadership along with you on issues that um, impact our nation and the communities that we serve. Um, so thank you in advance for all of your contributions today and over the next days. Um, the program will, for today consists of a panel discussion on sovereign debt markets, I'll come back to this in a moment, followed by a moderated discussion with New York Fed President John Williams and late in the afternoon, um, you'll stay out of the heat and humidity outside, I hope, by joining us um, at a very nice reception. Um, before we get into the panel, uh, first, please join me in welcoming Raphael Schoenel, who is an associate professor of economics at the Department of Economics at Brandeis University, and uh, recently served as director, deputy director for the Center on Inflation Research at the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland. Raphael is advisor and consultant to CEBRA, and right now we'll share the official welcome on their behalf. So, Raphael. Um, hi, everybody, and also thank you very much, Linda. You know, you said more than I can probably say, so you're really well prepared. Thank you. You know, okay. um, I'll keep it brief. Um, you know, my name is Raphael Schoenle, and I'm, I'm actually substituting for the other Raphael, Raphael Auer, in the official role that he has, but he cannot be here today, so he sends his, his regards, and uh, I would like to welcome you as well, obviously, to, to this year's uh, meeting. And as Linda said, I also uh, serve as the scientific director for CEBRA, and in that role, um, I'm responsible partly for putting together the program for this meeting, together with the uh, you know, Doris and Victoria from the CEBRA office. I'm sure many of you have corresponded with them, with the organizers at the New York Fed, Linda and uh, Columbia, Patricia, uh, and all, all of you session chairs, uh, and everybody else who was involved in this really complex organization. So this really wouldn't be possible without you. Um, so thank you very much for, for all your input and help. And you know, this year this was especially important. It's really hard to put this program together because we had about 1,081 submissions, so that's, that's a record. Um, and for the first time, we also had excess demand for sessions, so for the first time we really had to down, turn down some sessions. That was very hard. Um, 
The upside is that the program, I think, is super exciting. And it really shows the breadth of all the topics that we face these days in economics, uh, central banking gen in particular, and, 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 and the intersection of the two. Um, I'm also excited about the special poster session for earlier career women in economics that we're introducing this year, uh, as well as this, these three high-level panels that we have, one each day. So before we start with the first panel, uh, let me thank you all uh, for making this possible through your excellent submissions and all the work that uh, precedes it, and I look forward to a few really exciting days. Thank you. Okay, so I invite up the panel. Um, so panelists, please. Um, this panel is on sovereign debt, liquidity, and consequences. The panel is moderated by our own Anna Nordstrom. Uh, Anna Nordstrom is head of the international market function and the interim head of do the domestic markets function in our markets group. So these two functions are responsible for implementing uh, domestic open market operations and foreign currency operations on behalf of the Federal Reserve System and for monitoring and analyzing domestic and international financial markets to inform the formulation and implementation of our monetary policy and our financial stability policy. Critical functions. They also provide certain fiscal agencies to services for the U.S. Treasury. So, Anna, take it away. And thank you. Thank you, Linda, for that kind introduction. And good afternoon, everyone. So today, I am very honored to moderate this panel on sovereign debt markets. And before introducing our excellent panelists, I wanted to briefly introduce the topic and the organization of this panel. First, a disclaimer that what I say here does not necessarily reflect the views of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York or the Federal Reserve System. So why this topic? Well, sovereign debt sits at the center of the global financial system and the strong functioning of the markets in which sovereign debt instruments are issued and traded plays a crucial role worldwide in everything from government financing to monetary policy implementation to enabling companies to hedge risks and individuals to save for the future. In recent years, as you may all well know, we have witnessed episodes of sudden and material erosion in the conditions of certain sovereign debt markets, and perhaps most notably in the historically deep and liquid US Treasury market. Some of these episodes have been so severe that we can comfortably describe them as outright dysfunction. I will leave it to our expert panelists here to share their perspectives on the current sources of fragility in these crucially important markets as well as their ideas for how to strengthen the functioning of sovereign debt markets within and across jurisdictions. I will close by saying that we at the New York Fed care deeply about these issues. We follow them closely and we contribute as a member of the Interagency Working Group for Treasury Market Surveillance and through our sponsorship of the Treasury Markets Practices Group. We very much look forward to hearing from our panelists on these issues. So the format for this panel is as follows. So first, each panelist will give introductory remarks. And then second, I will post questions for the panel. And then we will open it up for questions from the audience. So let me introduce our panelists uh, briefly. So our first panelist is uh, Joyce Chang who has multiple decades experience in the investment banking industry. And since 1999 has been at JP Morgan. Joyce is currently the chair of global research and a member of the management committee for JP Morgan's corporate and investment bank. She and her team provide clients with informed views and actionable ideas 
on economic indicators, markets, and companies around the world. Prior to JP Morgan, Joyce was a managing director at Merrill Lynch and Salomon Brothers. Joyce has a BA from Columbia University and won the college's John Jay Award in 2014. And she has a Master of Public Affairs from the Woodrow Wilson School at Princeton University. Today, Joyce will provide an overview of sovereign debt markets, dynamics across jurisdictions, in a changing financial environment, their liquidity conditions, and current issues. Our second panelist is Josh Frost, who has long history with financial markets and public policy, including a distinguished experience at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. Josh is currently the Assistant Secretary for Financial Markets at the US Department of the Treasury, a position he has held since 2021. So before serving as Assistant Secretary, Josh worked at the New York Fed for more than 20 years in various roles. He was most recently the co-chair of the liquidity program for systemically important financial institution supervision. Prior to this, he spent almost two decades in the markets group in a variety of leadership positions, including a role overseeing the two corporate credit facilities launched in response to the pandemic and serving as director of money markets and director of treasury markets, where his teams launched the secured overnight financing rate, conducted open market operations, and facilitated auctions of debt on behalf of the treasury. Josh received his bachelor's degree in mathematics and psychology from Rutgers University and his master's degree in business administration with a concentration in finance from New York University. Today, Josh will focus on explaining how the US Debt Management Office approaches market liquidity in its debt issuance and management strategy. Our third panelist is Imen Ramoni Rousseau who has also multi-decade experience in financial markets and policy at central banks. From February 2020, Imen has been the Director General of Market Operations at the European Central Bank, in charge of implementing the single monetary policy of the euro area, together with the national central banks of the euro system. Her responsibilities include lending operations and collateral, asset purchase programs, and foreign exchange resource management as well as market monitoring and intelligence. Imen was previously the director of markets at Banque de France and worked for five years at the Bank for International Settlements, where she led the vulnerability analysis team of the Financial Stability Board Secretariat. She holds a master's degree in economics and finance from École Centrale de Paris and from Sciences Po. Today, Iman will offer perspectives on how a central bank approaches changes in market functioning in its monetary policy implementation and policy responses. And last but not least, we have Alexandra Tombini, who has also multi-decade experience in financial markets, economics, and policy at international organizations and central banks. Alexandra is currently the chief representative of the Bank for International Settlements Office for the Americas a position he holds since September 2019. Before joining the BIS, he was executive director of the board at the International Monetary Fund for Brazil, the Dominican Republic, Ecuador, and some other Central American countries. Previously, he was with the Central Bank of Brazil, where he served as governor and also in the roles of deputy governor for financial system regulation and deputy governor for economic research. He has also held positions at, as a board member of the BIS and chairman of the Standing Committee on Budget Resources of the Financial Stability Board. Alexandra holds a PhD in economics from the University of Illinois. Today, Alexandra will review sovereign debt market dynamics in some Latin American countries, explaining factors that could challenge their resilience and recalling policy actions taken to enhance the market liquidity and support the functioning of these sovereign debt markets. So let me now turn the podium to Joyce for her introductory remarks and other panelists will follow her.
Well, good afternoon. It's such a pleasure to be here, and we value the dialogue with the New York Fed so much at J.P. Morgan. But thank you, Linda, for the um, introduction, for the invitation, and Anna. Wonderful to be here. So I'm going to talk mostly about the U.S. Treasury market, but also make a few comments um, on emerging markets at the end as well. Um, and wonderful to be with um, Alessandra, with Imine, and with Josh on this panel. So let me start by just giving an overview of just the size of the growth of the sovereign debt market as a starting point before I turn to the treasury market. So if you take a look at this chart, from the period before the global financial crisis um, in 2007 to 2022, Public sector debt, sovereign debt, increased by about 30 percentage points on average for 13 of the 21 major developed markets and over 45 percentage points for nine of the major countries. And you can see that this has basically surged to 122% of GDP, um, and the average increase has been um, you know, you know, um, staggering. So that's just setting the stage for what's happening on the Treasury market. But you can also see that expenditures remain elevated and we estimate that it's about 2.3 percentage points of GDP above the 2019 level. So a buildup in sovereign debt and fiscal debt. So what does this mean for the treasury market? Well, the treasury market has grown sixfold over the past 15 years, but the number of primary dealers has not grown. The dealer inventory of treasuries has been relatively steady over the same period, and if you look at total bank capital, it has only doubled over the same period. So what we have seen is this big uptake in automatic, um, automated market makers that have picked up the slack. Algorithmic activity um, has basically reached, we think, about 75% of the market participants. And this compares to about 40% um, a decade ago. Um, we estimate that the market depth, which we view as the best measure of liquidity, and the depth is the amount that you can actually transact in key trading hours, has fallen by about 60% with the automated market makers having 75% market share. Um, and so you know, one thing that we have looked at is uh, just you know, the current market conditions. And what we do show here is that there is um, you, um, a disproportionate um, you know, um, share of provided liquidity that's sometimes on routine data releases and market events like payrolls, the auctions, the post-FOMC meetings. So I, the conclusion really is that this high-frequency trading activity has introduced another pro-cyclical and amplifying mechanism for volatility in times of market stress. And um, if you can see this, um, you can just see that we're really settling at a baseline level of liquidity that's lower than it was four years ago, even though we've seen that market conditions have stabilized. Um, and so intuitively, this you know, makes sense. The delivered volatility has moderated as the Fed has slowed some of the paces of the rate hikes, but it remains elevated as the total extent and duration of monetary tightening left in the cycle is still uncertain. Um, you know, one of the questions were, was, what are the solutions um, and what policy actions can be taken about this? And I would just say this, you really need to see a sustainable expansion in liquidity um, on increasing the intermediation in the treasury market. A lot of these joint regulatory agency initiatives, I think, will improve the resiliency, but they won't necessarily improve the liquidity that easily. So this just shows you the market depth. Um, for U.S. Treasuries, and you can see how much it has dropped if you look at the market depth over the last um, you know, decade, since 2013. And as Anna had mentioned, many of these events that we saw were really extraordinary disruptions. And if you look at what happened at the front end of the yield curve, we've really only seen um, you know, uh, you know, volatility like this maybe one other time during the last century for what we saw on the front end moving 70 basis points. So we have seen um, a nascent recovery um, in the market depth that's taken hold. We think it's increased by about $40 million through the 10-year equivalents year to date. So there has been stabilization here. But this still is, if you look at this historically, um, a very depressed liquidity measure um, compared to average levels that have been observed over the last decade. 
Um, so th this is our favorite measure of liquidity. Um, and by market depth, we mean really the amount that you can transact during key trading hours. We look at the um, sort of the bid ask and the top market um, players. So the market liquidity, I would characterize it as poor, but functioning smoothly right now. Um, you, but there is treasury curve dispersion, which I think is explained by volatility and dealer positioning, although this has improved since late last year. But basically, we found that volatility and dealer positioning explain the treasury curve dispersion. And we've looked at the root mean square error. As volatility increases, it's harder to hold the, off the, um, to hold the less liquid off the rotten. And so what we see is that the root mean square error basically increases when dealers hold less warehouse risk. Um, so we, um, you know, just uh, you can, and, and you can just see that the liquidity metrics have deteriorated, but we do see that the off the runs are basically trading at a small discount relative to the on the runs. Now, turning to the, um, just talk a, a bit about the volatility that we saw last year, and I think something that Josh can talk about more. Um, the dispersion at the long end of the curve has actually come crashing down. And I think that Treasury actually did play a role in this. Um, you know, it consistently cut the 20 year auction sizes throughout 2022 in order to more correctly align with the original dealer and investor expectations. And that improved the liquidity um, in this process. Um, but I wanted to turn now and just talk a little bit about um, the current market conditions because um, in the uh, um, aftermath of the, the debt ceiling, the increase, we do see um, you know, a big increase in um, net treasury issuance, um, bill issuance to come, which we think will exceed about a trillion dollars over the balance of this year. And I think this is gonna put some downward pressure on reserves and bank um, deposits. So we um, you know, see that about one and a half um, trillion dollars of net treasury bill issuance for the whole year with one trillion that's still um, remaining. And I do think that treasury is likely to be somewhat underfunded through fiscal year 24. Um, there is, um, you know, and what I'd like to really just show is the way in which some of the market participants um, here are changing and transforming. So the ownership of treasury market is moving from more price insensitive hands to more price sensitive um, investors. And so prior to the pandemic, the Fed owned about 13% of the share of the treasury markets, but this has nearly doubled since 2022. And even with quantitative tightening, the Fed's share has only declined by two percentage points. Um, this should accelerate as the issuance picks up over the coming months. Um, but we do think that um, you know, it matters here. We estimate that for each one percentage point increase in the Fed's share of the Treasury market, that's tended to flatten the 5s, 30s curves by almost three basis points. So the ongoing QE process should contribute to the ongoing steepening um, as well. But um, we do see a change um, in the market um, ownership happening. Um, the US bank holdings of treasuries have declined by about $200 billion from the peak of last, um, middle of last year, given the declines that we've seen in deposits. And we think that um, banks are still um, decreasing some of their treasury balances in the second half of the year. We've also seen some shifts in foreign demand um, as global FX reserves have been growing more slowly and the share of dollar reserves has been coming down. So um, it, it, what we see is that the treasury supply is poised to pick up significantly um, you know, and the, the ownership is increasing. So that's something that we also take into consideration when we think about liquidity risk if there were to be shocks. Um, and we do think the treasury's financing needs are still on an upward trend. Um, we expect the budget deficit to widen to about $1.48 trillion um, uh, um, you know, in fiscal year 2023, $1.575 trillion in fiscal year 2024. So, um, so that's just a, a bit just on the structure of the market. Um, I want to highlight some of the work that's been done by Alex Weiss and my group, who's here in the audience, one of our newest PhDs to um, join the group, but really taking a look at the whole issue of debt sustainability um, and um, what type of um, primary surplus you would actually need um, to stabilize the debt levels. 
And estimates are that you would need net lending of the developed markets to improve by 3.8 percentage points from the current level of a, a negative 3.4% of GDP to keep the debt from rising. And so this means, like, if you look at debt stability in the U.S., that's 4.4 percentage points of tightening. In Japan, the hurdle is actually 9 percentage points. So um, you know, just an ongoing challenge with liquidity that I think is not going to disappear. Um, you know, the biggest challenge really is if the yields on debt were um, one percentage point higher, very few countries would meet the threshold for maintaining stable debt as a share of output by 2025. Um, the, um, you know, and, and we do have a view. It's a bit of an outlier view, so I will highlight it. And Alex is here, can also answer questions about this. But we have um, a higher estimate for um, our star for where re real yields are going than consensus. Um, we look at a longer term horizon, 10 years, meaning a longer term horizon. Could you see real yields at 2.5%? So we have a five year, five year real US forward rate right now that's 1.3% um, on its 20 year average. Um, you know, but right now everybody's saying, will this price back to normal? We raise the question on whether there are structural factors that mean um, higher real yields from here. Um, and, with that, um, you know, and, and with that, just implications for the debt service. Um, let me conclude with just a few words on emerging market sovereign debt, because I'm often asked the question, are emerging market sovereign debt facing um, a financial crisis? And the first thing I would say is that if you look at the composition of the emerging markets bond index right now, there's more than 70 sovereigns in that bond index. There's a market capitalization that's grown to $620 billion. The part that's vulnerable is the frontier market piece of it under the common framework that's about $70 billion of the um, uh, $620 billion. So it is not, in our opinion, a systemic problem, but you can also see the real difference in yields here. The frontier market countries trade at north of 13% yields. The double B rated emerging markets countries trade at around 7% yields for the bucket. Um, we've seen that for um, sovereign CDS, this has been largely you know, unchanged um, you know, from August of 2019 for the US compared to the real um, you know, volatility we saw around the global financial crisis in 2008. But you can see in emerging markets, there's been a clear differentiation here really in the frontier markets versus the rest of the emerging markets index. So um, just let me, let me stop there. Thank you. Sorry, oh, flipping through the disclosure Chris, pages. Oh, yes, please flip that forward. I'm sorry. There we go. <laughs> so sorry. I don't have like eight <laughs> disclosure pages at the end of mine, if that helps, amen. Um, I, I thought I'd uh, try to spend the next five minutes or so uh, walking through a couple of considerations from, as the issuer. Um, I think my challenge here is going to be keeping this to five minutes. Um, those who know me, I, I could probably go for about 30. Uh, I will not uh, for everyone's sanity. So um, look, m maybe just at, at the top level, uh, what I've got here in bold, we think of the, a well-functioning and liquid treasury market as critical um, for a few different reasons. One, the role it plays in funding the government. That's first and foremost why the treasury market exists but also for the roles it plays in the implementation of monetary policy and its role as a kind of key underpinning for the global financial system. Um, as we think about uh, any time you hear me, somebody in my seat, or other people at Treasury talk about the Treasury market, you'll hear a few mantras that we repeat, and one of which is that our principal objective is to fund the U.S. government at the lowest cost over time. And so what's the nexus with today's presentation? Well, here. We're here to talk about liquidity in the treasury market. So from, from my perspective, having a deep and liquid secondary market um, meets all of the objectives above, both funding the government, monetary policy implementation, and, the and having a smooth functioning global financial system. But even narrowly, as the issuer, we get a pretty significant benefit from having a deep and liquid secondary market, which is we get paid for it. Um, Having a deep and liquid market means we, we experience a liquidity premium at our auctions, and it furthers this idea that we're going to fund the U.S. government at the lowest cost over time. Um, we've talked about liquidity. Joyce highlighted, I, I thought, a, a number of key metrics that we, we look at as well. I thought I'd maybe just uh, give a broad overview of how we, some of the measures we think about when we talk about liquidity. 
uh, in broad buckets, qualitative and quantitative. So just quickly on the qualitative side, we get feedback from a broad array of market participants, uh, our primary dealers in our primary dealer system, what we call our Treasury Borrowing Advisory Committee, or TBAC. It's, it's a group of private sector market participants that we meet with every quarter to give us pretty narrow, focused advice on our debt management decisions, uh, and uh, an array of bilateral outreach with, uh, with market participants across the world. Um, on the quantitative side, um, you know, Joyce, you highlighted market depth, which is, I think, a, a critical one. I just wanted to put a few others out there that somewhat more familiar bid ask that I think a lot of people look at as well. Um, one that I, I tend to look at uh, a bit more frequently is, is price impact. So instead of just the depth at the, the top of the book, how large of a trade does it take to move the market by a given amount of yield? So to me, that's, I, it, for most market participants as I speak with them and they give me their gut answer, what is liquidity? Liquidity means I can get a big trade done without moving the market. And so that's an, a, a, one other measure we look at is price impact. Um, I would say current, I'll just briefly turn to a, a quick current state assessment of treasury market liquidity. Um, I think over the last year and a half or so, certainly since the uh, invasion of Ukraine, um, we have seen treasury market liquidity lower than it was in 2021. Um, you know, I, I guess I have a slightly different takeaway from that scatter plot chart. I guess the way I've tended to look at that is that if I look at the degree of macroeconomic uncertainty, the degree of change in expectations for monetary policy, the just overall level of volatility, uh, I think most of the um, deterioration in liquidity we've seen over the last year and a half or so uh, has been an outcome of the volatility that we've seen as opposed to a cause of the volatility we've seen. That's where, as the issuer, I would be much more concerned if the causality went the other way. If we were seeing uh, liquidity issues result in volatility, and I think qualitatively and quantitatively, I, I don't think that's what we're seeing at this point. Um, and I'd be remiss if I didn't use, I, I mentioned a mantra you'll hear from, uh, from Treasury every time we talk about debt issuance. Another one is, uh, we believe that this continues to serve as the deepest and most liquid market in the world for a lot of those reasons. Um, I want to spend a couple of minutes just walking through three channels uh, through which we promote a, a liquid treasury market. Um, first, how we think about our issuance strategy. Second, what's called our IAWG, or Interagency Working Group on Treasury Market Surveillance that Anna alluded to. And finally, a, a relatively new topic for us of buybacks. So first, from our, uh, the perspective of our issuance strategy, the, the hallmark of our issuance strategy is being regular and predictable. Um, we believe that an outcome of this strategy is improved liquidity in the market. It reduces uncertainty for investors. Um, it limits the market volatility associated with our issuance decisions. Uh, and it allows our auctions to serve as a liquidity event in the treasury market. They are, are on a regular cadence with stable sizes. This works out well for us, especially in times of market stress. Uh, I note also something that comes up often um, is what I'll call free advice. Uh, from the market about some of our issuance patterns, that we should be more proactive, seek to time the market a bit more. This point on the curve looks, looks cheap from the issuer's perspective. You should issue more here. Hit it hard. Um, I think what you'll hear from us uh, pretty consistently over decades is that we don't want to be seen as timing the market. I think being regular and predictable is probably at its core somewhat inconsistent with being um, overly reactive to, to short-term trends in the market. Um, also, the, as Joyce pointed out, the treasury market's pretty big. Uh, and as a, the issuer in a 25-ish trillion dollar market of marketable securities, um, if we saw a point on the curve that looked like we could take advantage of it, the second we announced that move, the market would move pretty quickly and most of those gains would, uh, those apparent gains would be seen to disappear. Um, when we, second bullet here, when we, when we seek to change our uh, issuance patterns, we look at what I'll call structural supply and demand in the treasury market um, as opposed to short-term uh, short trends. So uh, one, one example is in late 2021 and last year, um, 
we realized that if we continued to issue at the pace we were issuing of nominal treasury securities, we would be overfunded. And so what did we do? We had to cut back our issuance of securities. We did that with an eye towards liquidity. So what we did was we decreased the size of our seven and 20 year securities by a disproportionate amount to our other securities for the reasons that Joyce mentioned. We, we got a, a fair bit of feedback that we had, the Treasury Department had pushed too hard on those points in association with the immediate aftermath uh, of the pandemic, uh, the onset of the pandemic. Um, one thing we seek to do is size our auctions correctly. This may seem trite, but we wanna make sure not too big, not too small, just right. Um, I think what we saw with the 20-year security in the first half or so, maybe summer of 2020, it was not sized right. It was too large. Um, what we also endeavor to do is ensure we don't have a security that's too small. So we have this concept of, of benchmark liquidity. We want to make sure that we don't have a security that's out there without sufficient float. Um, and we would look for signs of scarcity there, signs of specialness in the repo market, frictions in settlement. Those things would cost us as issuer from a liquidity perspective. So on both sides, both when we're increasing and decreasing the size of our securities, we take liquidity into account. Uh, I have last on this slide one current topic we've been thinking about, which is considering the liquidity benefits of changing the auction cycle for our two, three, five, and seven year notes from what would be a new issue security each month, which is how we currently do it, to a quarterly new issue with two reopenings. This may sound like a pretty technical point, but just in passing, I'll, I'll mention this because I think it's just another example of, of how liquidity concerns factor into our issuance patterns. Um, I'll, I'll, do, I'll do math uh, that I, I probably shouldn't do for this audience, which is just a, a simple point. We have a seven-year security, we issue a new one every month. That, that results in steady state 84 outstanding seven-year notes at any given time. If we instead move to a quarterly cycle, that would be cut to 28. That's a pretty big savings if one of the things you're worried about is balance sheet netting. Um, as Anna mentioned, we've got this interagency working group on treasury market surveillance. I'll, I'll cover this quite briefly. This is a, an interagency working group across the US government. It's been around for a little over 30 years, but has really gotten more active in the last nine or so years. Um, this is the SEC, CFTC, Fed Board, Treasury, and our hosts here at the New York Fed. Um, we've had annual conferences where we've talked about the progress that this group has made over the last several years across the, the work streams I've got listed here on the slide, improving the resilience of market intermediation, improving data quality and availability, expansion of central clearing, enhancing trading venue transparency and oversight, and finally, the effects of leverage and fund liquidity risk management practices. Um, a couple areas where Treasury specifically among the five interagency working group members has been quite focused, has been working with uh, FINRA on more public transparency via trace data. So this is the trade reporting and compliance engine providing trade level data on activity in fixed income markets and specifically here about the Treasury market. Um, they're currently working through a proposal to release secondary market transaction data for on the run nominal coupon securities with some decisions to come in the future about uh, what we would do for off the run securities as well. Uh, and finally, the Treasury Department's Office of Financial Research has proposed to begin a permanent data collection of transactions in the non-centrally cleared bilateral repo market. This is one of the largest remaining gaps we have from an information perspective in the official sector. And it's our hope that this can help us monitor and assess financial stability risks stemming from this important sector going forward. Finally, uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention buybacks. Uh, so in May, we announced plans to implement a buyback program at some time in 2024. Um, this would be the first time Treasury's had buybacks since, I'd say the last ones ended about 23 years ago, it'll be by the time we finish this. Um, there at the time, we were focused on surpluses as far as the eye could see, and concerns about benchmark liquidity and having Treasury securities that were too small. Um, I will just say that is not the principal motivation this time. I've got the two, uh, two principal objectives listed here, both liquidity support and cash management. Uh, from a liquidity perspective, it's our thought that with a, having a predictable opportunity for market participants to sell off the run securities to Treasury, it should, it should enable over time uh, market participants to become more comfortable with making markets knowing that there's an outlet for that uh, on a regular basis. 
Secondly, we've got cash management. Uh, our cash balance can be quite volatile at times. Think uh, seasonal, issue, seasonal uh, tax receipts. And uh, our thinking is we could use uh, some of that excess cash we get around the tax season to conduct some buybacks of shorter dated securities as well. Um, maybe I'll just leave it with uh, our, how we think buybacks might work. Um, they'll work best if they're regular and predictable. If they're not used to fundamentally change the maturity structure of our debt, they're just not going to be big enough to do that. Uh, and if they are not used to mitigate episodes of acute market stress, that's just, uh, this is not doable in that size. We're not talking about a March 2020 tool. This is more of a, a peacetime tool. And with that, I'll turn it over to Amen. So good afternoon, everybody, and uh, it's a real pleasure uh, to be here also under you know, Anna's uh, leadership for this panel um, on this topic on which we had you know, a number of conversations, I think, over the year, yeah? Um, so, I mean, what I would provide uh, on my side from, from the ECB is actually, uh, I would say, the perspective of both the central bank uh, with uh, basically a mindset of uh, uh, safeguarding smooth market functioning, but also a central bank that has been um, obviously in the market uh, for uh, QE and also for market stabilization intervention uh, in, in the past years, yeah. So I'll, I'll basically have three messages in the next uh, 10 minutes. Uh, one is about bond market uh, resilience. The second about uh, how and when central banks uh, intervene uh, in sovereign bond markets. And the third one is about um, how central banks, more in normal times or peace times, as uh, Josh said, <laughs> actually also uh, act to uh, safeguard uh, good and smooth market functioning. So first message really today, and I think it's a really a very good time uh, to voice this message, uh, is to take a moment to reflect on the remarkable resilience of sovereign debt markets over the past year. And I can tell you that coming from the euro area, this is really an important, um, I would say, development that I think many uh, would not have expected uh, when we engaged uh, into our normalization cycle. So let me just recall, in the euro area, we have raised our key interest rates by 400 basis points uh, in the last year or so. At the same time, we have uh, reduced our balance sheet quite significantly through actually two things. One is, like here in the US, the QT process. And so we have uh, uh, actually started in February to reduce the size of our um, main uh, QE program city uh, APP and uh, actually just Last, uh, the, the, the last week, uh, we uh, discontinued completely the reinvestments on this program. And the second stream is that we also had this, during the uh, pandemic, these very large uh, lending operations, the TLTROs, that uh, we've also been uh, you know, experiencing the, la the largest repayments of the largest operations that we had during COVID in a very smooth uh, way. In addition to all these uh, normalization measures, uh, only a few months ago, we, we also went through you know, banking stress uh, originating here in the US, but also with spillovers, as you have seen uh, in Credit Suisse and, and other parts of uh, the banking system. And despite these developments, despite all of this, we have been observing a picture of resilience in Euro area bond markets, yeah? And so uh, now, I'll, I'll kind of transition to the second message, which is about uh, highlighting the role that our interventions at central banks play in preserving the orderly functioning of uh, financial markets. And here, let me start with the following question. When should central banks intervene to address uh, market dysfunction? In the euro area, we actually have a dual view on this question. Um, and this dual view comes from two possible threats uh, to the transmission of monetary policy. 
The first threat to transmission can in principle be faced by all central banks. So basically, uh, transmission of monetary policy can be threatened by excess volatility in markets, poor liquidity, non-linear dynamics in core financial markets. And that's the case for intervention. The second type of market dysfunction instead is really more specific to the euro area. The monetary policy transmission in a currency union can be undermined by heightened financial fragmentation across jurisdictions and in an extreme scenario by self-fulfilling expectations questioning the integrity of monetary union itself. And so historically, the ECB has um, tackled uh, market uh, dysfunction from these two sources with a wide range of market uh, stabilization tools, both on uh, lending operations and asset purchases. And the pandemic was a very good example of this, yeah? So we had, on the one hand, a special pandemic purchase program, the PEPP or PEP, and this was kind of coupled with sizable lending operations, the famous TLDRO that I mentioned, which were also coupled to collateral easing measures as well as uh, uh, operations on uh, the swap lines and, uh, and repo lines. And so while the ECB and other central banks have done a lot to stabilize financial markets over the past 15 years, I think there are also limits uh, to uh, what central banks can and cannot do. In the euro area, we have specific safeguards that play a crucial role in the design of our interventions. And two in particular are worth noting. The first one is the monetary financing prohibition, and the second one is the principle of proportionality. And these limits constitute a useful reminder that central banks should not be the only game in town when markets become dysfunctional. With these considerations in mind, I'd like now to delve a little bit more into uh, uh, the two policy interventions uh, or two policy instruments to uh, intervene in markets uh, that in my view are very relevant these days in the euro area. And sorry for the number of acronyms, so I hope, <laughs> I hope uh, this is still fine, but we, we do like acronyms, so here I have uh, two of them. One is the Pandemic Emergency Purchase Program, the PEP, uh, on the left here that we started in March 20. And the second one is a bit of the new kid on the block, which is the Transmission Protection Instrument, uh, the TPI, announced in July 2022. So these two measures share the same objective with regard to uh, market functioning and smooth transmission of monetary policy. And so they aim at removing impairments in the transmission of monetary policy that could be created by dysfunction in financial markets. However, they differ in several dimensions. So the PEP was a temporary, flexible program designed to address the economic fallout of the pandemics. It came with no conditionality and it involved massive purchases totaling 1.7 trillion from March 2020 to March 2022. And this was coupled at the time with also a strong fiscal response that you can see also here on, on the chart at the national level and also at the European level with the, uh, for the first time, uh, the issuance of common uh, European debt by the European Commission, so the next generation EU and SURE programs. And the PEP, together with these uh, uh, fiscal measures, has been really very uh, effective, and you can see that on, on the chart, in stabilizing markets uh, during the pandemic crisis. Contrasting with the temporary nature of the PEP, the TPI, our new instrument, is a permanent tool. It's a permanent tool in the ECB's toolkit designed to counter unwarranted, disorderly market dynamics that can occur at any time. Unlike the PEP, it doesn't have ex ante limits to the volume of purchases and it has built-in eligibility requirements for you know, sovereign bond markets that would benefit from it, and also conditionality to mitigate moral hazard. 
We have so far seen no need to activate the TPI, so the instrument is, uh, you know, useful without even a single euro being spent on it. And its announcement has helped by itself to preempt risks of market dysfunction. And the chart on the right provides evidence in this direction of how the TPI works by its mere existence in protecting the, the um, smooth functioning of sovereign bond markets. So basically the yellow bars here visualize the range of spillovers from variations in Italian spreads to uh, spreads to German bonds. So from Italian spreads to Spanish and Portuguese um, bond spreads based on historical regularities over the past decade, including the sovereign debt crisis. So this is the range in yellow that you have historically. By contrast, the blue diamond shows the actual spillover from the Italian spreads to the Spanish and Portuguese spreads in response to three market moving events in the summer of 2022. And these are uh, uh, the, uh, both three of them in Italy, the confidence vote on the government, um, President Draghi's resignation, and then uh, the downgrade by Standard & Poor's. So all of these three events had the, the potential to really be um, triggering contagion across sovereign bond markets in the euro area. But instead, because the TPI was announced before these three events occurred, what we have seen is actually that the blue diamonds are really in the lowest range of historical estimates meaning that the TPI announcement succeeded in lowering the risk of contagion across uh, the euro area. So, summing up, I think we are confident saying that these two policy interventions, the PEP and the TPI, have had the intended effect of preserving the smooth transmission of uh, monetary policy across jurisdictions. And in many ways, they've been complementary and their presence helps explain the remarkable resilience of sovereign debt markets in the euro area, despite, as I mentioned, the speed and the scale of policy normalization. Let me now turn to a bit more peace times and you know, what we've been doing um, during our QE program in order to support market functioning. So um, clearly we were, uh, purchasing heavily uh, between 2015 and last week <laughs> uh, on our uh, QE program, the APP. And these large scale asset purchases might have unintended side effects on the functioning of markets. But to minimize these side effects, we have put in place uh, a number of mechanisms that I wanted to mention briefly. So one of them is market neutrality meaning that uh, while our objective is to influence the level of yields, I think we all agree, if, if you run QE, this is basically to uh, uh, make uh, your monetary policy stance you know, more accommodative when you want to see lower bond yields, but you don't want to influence relative prices across the curve, and you don't want to impair the price discovery mechanism. Yeah? And to achieve this objective, in the daily uh, implementation of our purchases, we pursue a high level of transparency and predictability. And this is important not to surprise markets, but at the same time, we also maintain, and that's a delicate balance, agility in our daily implementation to avoid being front run by the markets. And there is an, uh, really an ingrained uh, tension between predictability on the one hand and agility on the other hand, yeah? So everyone generally knows what to expect from us, that's predictability and what we will do, uh, but in our daily operations, we retain the possibility to deviate and adjust for seasonal liquidity patterns, for local conditions, as well as market moving events. Another potential side effects of purchases is creating scarcity 
uh, of high quality collateral and of course sovereign bonds are high quality collateral in the market because we buy all of these securities from the market. So here again, we have in place mechanisms to mitigate that. And we have them both ex ante and ex post. So ex ante, uh, we, um, to the extent possible, we avoid purchasing specific securities such as current cheapest to deliver bonds that are in high demand for private financial market participants. And by, by basically avoiding to focus our purchases on these kind of on the run, cheapest to deliver securities, uh, we also uh, mitigate to some extent uh, scarcity of these securities. Moreover, we also buy from a wide range of counterparties. We have more than 200 counterparties across uh, Euro area jurisdictions. And we use different kinds of uh, operations. We use auctions, we use bilateral trading, with also different protocols uh, to align with the market conditions. Ex post, we also have, like the Fed, a securities lending facility. And this is a facility that puts back bonds into the market when needed. And actually, uh, and this you see on the chart on the right, we've been quite proactive in adjusting the capacity of this securities lending facility, meaning the limits, the maximum limit that we can lend under this facility. And uh, we have increased this limit uh, uh, actually three times. You see these, um, these bars, these uh, dashed bars uh, here, which mark the moments where we have increased the limits. And that was actually to alleviate scarcity um, in uh, these securities. And uh, the, the latest limit increase was in November 2022 and had, I think, a positive impact that was uh, uh, relatively quick uh, on the market functioning uh, on sovereign bond markets, in particular on the Bund market, which is the market that suffers the most from this scarcity, given that it, it plays the role of a safe asset for the entire euro area, yeah, in reality. It's, it's, uh, it's uh, maybe the, the specific euro area reality that we need to take into account. So in summary, to minimize distortions to the functioning of euro area bond markets, we implement a tailored approach that is consistent with the heterogeneity of the 19 individual jurisdictions we um, operate with, and we do pursue the objective of market neutrality, uh, uh, which, which characterizes our asset purchases. And I think I'll stop there, and I'll take questions if there are any. Thank you. Well, good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much, Anna, for uh, inviting me to be here today, and Linda and, and Raphael. It's a, it's a pleasure to, uh, to speak on, on this panel on the, on the issues that uh, are quite important for not only for the functioning of uh, governments, but uh, more specifically for central banks. My words, this uh, introductory words uh, this afternoon will be uh, based on the, the largest uh, six uh, Latin American countries. So I'm not going to be talking about frontier markets or, or developed markets, so I will focus from a different, slightly different perspective. No? As we have seen, I mean, um, public debt surge around the globe in, in the wake of the pandemic, and Latin America has been no exception on this. Uh, the median debt to GDP ratio uh, for the six uh, largest uh, Latin American countries rose uh, from 55 percent uh, in uh, 2019 to over 60 percent uh, one year later. But uh, this uh, medium ratio uh, hides uh, quite a bit of variation there. You have on, on one end Brazil, we just fell short from a triple digit uh, debt to GDP ratio, while you have Chile and Peru, for instance, uh, where uh, debt to GDP ratio never reached uh, 40 percent. Apart from in Argentina, uh, debt sustainability is not currently an issue for the largest Latin American economies. Debt levels may be high, uh, but they are manageable. But even if uh, sustainability is not an issue, uh, we know that higher uh, sovereign debt can reduce 
policy space, and making it more difficult to deal with future shocks. High uh, sovereign debt can also uh, complicate, make more complex the macroeconomic policy management, including uh, monetary policy. I'm not going to go in, in, in depth on this, but the main reason uh, for this is uh, risk premium on sovereign debt, which is very sensitive to market condition, irrespective of what's happening in the jurisdiction. Uh, I have a, a few colleagues, Ana Aguilar, Carlos Cantu, and Rafael Guerra. They have laid this out quite nicely in a recent uh, BIS bulletin on the issue of sovereign debt and risk premium. So the question is what uh, can uh, central banks, debt managers, and other financial policy makers in Latin America do to ensure uh, that market remain uh, liquid and risk premium contained? So of course, uh, first of all, I mean, there is no alternative to putting uh, public finances on a solid footing. In many countries, uh, this means fiscal consolidation and credible fiscal rules that ensure discipline over time in the future. Second, it's important for these countries in Latin America to grow their potential, to increase their potential uh, growth to allow them to sort of uh, uh, lower the, uh, the burden of, of uh, sovereign debt. Um, in addition to, to fiscal reforms, of course, this requires supply side uh, reforms that could unlock long-term uh, growth and improve climate for crucially needed private investment in, in the region. Third, uh, clever debt management and market development policies can help, even if they uh, cannot uh, substitute for growth-friendly uh, fiscal policy and structural reforms. Debt managers, as we know and heard from Josh today, I mean, can, they cannot uh, affect the overall level of government debt, but they can influence when and under which conditions it comes due. For example, they can reduce the rollover needs each year by extending and distributing maturities. They can reduce the sensitivity of nominal payments to interest rate fluctuations by issuing debt at fixed rates. Issuing local instead of foreign currency denominated debt can reduce the impact of exchange rate fluctuations. Of course, the benefits must be set against the costs. Issues of fixed rate long-term debt tend to pay the term premium and those domestic currency debt a premium for exchange rate risk. The situation in the region some 40 years ago on the eve of the 1980s debt crisis was quite different. Most sovereign debt was in Latin America was short term and denominated in foreign currency. Since then, we have a big change in the composition of the debt and the duration of the sovereign debt in the region. Today, less than 5% of Brazil's public debt and less than 20% of Mexico's is denominated in foreign currency. Debt duration has also increased. Many Latin American economies used the favorable financial conditions after the great financial crisis to issue long-term fixed rate debt. And this ha has paid uh, off handsomely in the last uh, two years, limiting the pass-through of higher interest rates to debt services. Uh, burdens in, in the region. But debt management goes beyond uh, choosing the composition of debt as we know. Developing a diverse investor base is another key task. Diversity is important because investors with different investment needs and strategies behave differently. They are less likely uh, to buy or sell at the same time, which leads to deeper and more liquid secondary markets. Diversity can also mean a good mix of traders who provide liquidity and institutional investors who hold assets for the long term. There has been substantial progress on this front in Latin. Domestic non-bank investors such as pension and mutual funds and insurance companies have become significant investors in their respective domestic bond markets. For example, in Brazil and Mexico, they hold well over half of the outstanding public debt. International diversification is also important. Latin America's sovereign debt has become mainstream among large global money managers and institutional investors. Ancillary markets also matter. The bond market, as we know, does not exist in a vacuum. It requires repo and derivative markets to become liquid and efficient. 
These markets allow investors to hang on to their securities positions when faced with cash needs or if they want to adjust their exposures to exchange and interest rate risk without having to sell uh, the underlying assets. Hedging markets in Latin America have grown in recent decades. FX derivatives, denominated Mexican peso and Brazilian real, for example, are 12th and 13th largest such markets in the world in absolute terms. For interest rate derivatives, the real ranks 8th and the Mexican peso 14th. In addition, there are a number of technical decisions, as Joshua presented a while ago, that can help improve liquidity. Latin America debt managers now hold regular auctions at pre-announced dates. So the issue here of being predictable and not taking just an opportunistic uh, position out of uh, debt management is, is very important uh, for the region. They also allow international clearing uh, of their securities, uh, which uh, greatly facilitates the participation of international investors in their respective markets. So I think so far, so good. I mean, we have seen progress in, in uh, sovereign debt markets in Latin America, but a key challenge is to ensure uh, liquidity when it's most needed during times of stress. If markets suddenly uh, turn illiquid, investors will not be able to exit positions, as we know, except at a very great cost. Hedging strategies that rely on liquid markets break down and no longer provide protection. And valuations can become detached from reality because there are no transactions to anchor uh, them. So for issuers as well, raising new funds or rolling over maturing debt becomes extremely expensive or nearly impossible. Again, a diverse investor base is the best first line of protection against sudden illiquidity. And news on these fronts are encouraging in the region in contrast to the 1990s when many investors fled at the first sign of trouble. There are indications that holders of emerging market debt are becoming more discriminating and are taking a long-term perspective. So, but uh, I think we need to, to consider that there are circumstances when the self-stabilizing force of a diverse investor base is not sufficient. The pandemic crisis being a case in point. In such exceptional circumstances, and only then, Central Bank can consider stepping in to provide liquidity through security swaps, purchases, and other instruments. So let me conclude at this point uh, to say that uh, um, Latin American countries have made tremendous progress in better managing their sovereign debt. Sovereign debt markets are much more, uh, much more liquid, efficient, and stable today than in the past. So perhaps the next uh, opportunity could be uh, just around the corner. And we have uh, laid out uh, recently at the BIS in Chapter 3, which is the, uh, the technological chapter, where uh, we argue that a unified ledger that combines central bank digital money, uh, tokenized deposit, tokenized assets, can reduce quite significantly the settlement uh, period of uh, every asset, any asset, including sovereign debt. So perhaps we are at the cusp of yet another uh, breakthrough in terms of uh, uh, functioning of sovereign debt markets around the globe and Latin America in particular. So I stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Joyce, uh, Josh, Iman, and Alexander for very interesting kickoff remarks. So um, I thought we could uh, start with a few questions uh, to each one of you to kick off the discussion. And of course, um, if, if someone says something and someone else wants to jump in along the way, feel free. We don't have to be wedded by, uh, by questioning each one of you. And then I will try to leave a few minutes for some questions from the audience to make sure we get that chance as well. So maybe Joyce, I can just begin with you um, since you went first. <laughs> so, um, so from your introductory remarks, um, 
There were two issues in particular. There were many issues that were very interesting, but two, two issues in particular that I was wondering if you could just maybe elaborate a little bit more on. So one is uh, on your point in the shift in intermediation and um, the considering the, the growth in outstanding treasuries and how it has, uh, you mentioned it has outpaced the dealer balance sheet. So you, you very much um, point to this shift in intermediation and I would just be interested to hear if you could just talk a little bit more about how this um, shift has impacted market function in your view from, from where you sit. Uh, so that's one question. And then just very briefly, um, it was very, also very interesting for a given level of volatility, depth in the treasury market has deteriorated over the recent years. Though you do describe mar uh, markets as functioning, uh, it sounds like so. How do you reconcile these two dynamics? Um, does the low depth create underlying fragilities in the market that, um, that are not visible on a day-to-day -day basis, but, but maybe really come to the surface in times of stress? No, thank you so much, Anna, for, um, you know, for those questions. So uh, you know, I, I think that you know, a, a lot of the proposals that I've seen um, seem like they will increase the resiliency, but not necessarily improve the liquidity that much. So the proposals to um, you know, broaden the definition of the dealers to increase institutions that are registered with the SEC, like improve the transparency for the on-the-run treasuries. But I think this is a big structural change, that it's moved to high-frequency trading. And that does mean that it's more vulnerable to volatility. And I agree completely with Josh that the, it, it's, the, the, the cause of this has been macro. It's, it's not that the market liquidity itself is causing is the cause of this, but I don't think those conditions, those underlying conditions are going to change with respect to um, the market players. And in fact, if anything, just from looking at our data points, I mean, we do think some of the US bank purchases are actually going to go down. The bank reserves will actually probably also come down right now. So I think that that is something that we need to live with. So I think the question comes back to, you know, what causes these episodes of volatility, right? And so, you know, we have seen, um, you know, things like the pandemic or the regional banking stress. Um, and um, it's these sort of events that have, you know, sort of like triggered a lot of the shocks. And then you've had the sort of uh, level of stabilization. But I think the real consequences, it goes back to the price impact. Like how much can you actually transact? Um, and that's really where my key concern is, is that you know, at the points where you've needed the central banks to do extraordinary intervention, it's because the size of what can be cleared in the marketplace really has plummeted. I, re I remember one day in, in March of 2020, it was like $12 million. So you can say it's the most liquid treasury market in the world, but you couldn't really even clear $12 million. I mean, for you know, the, the most liquid, deepest bond market in the world, which there's no doubt the treasury market is that. So what I worry about is the transaction size, that it's becoming quite one-sided. Um, you know, what events cause the volatility? Well. You know, if, if you, you if some of it could be geopolitical risk. I mean, um, you know, that, you know, like Russia's invasion of Ukraine. I mean, if you had, you know, ongoing geopolitical risk. Um, there could be that also, like, uh, a scenario where, um, let's just say inflation expectations um, remain elevated, inflation doesn't come down as much, and so there is more hiking that needs to be done. The market is positioned for um, something else. And, and honestly, I think that you know, the solutions to this are not that easy to come by. I think that um, Treasury has done a very good job of making it predictable, but also like tweaking it as they needed to, like the long end. Like the, the, and that's where we have seen real um, you know, fast and rapid normalization on those market conditions. But then you have other segments like the seven year, which is where a lot of the market, um, market activity is focused and the dynamics or expectations where I think it's harder to actually normalize that segment of the curve. Mm. Yeah. I think that, uh, Joyce, you're, you're spot on on this thing of you know, volatility and liquidity. And I would even add, I mean, I was um, actually with you at this BIS you know, annual conference where I discussed a paper by Daryl Duffy and others that basically goes about this triangle between um, volatility liquidity and dealer balance sheet capacity. So that's the triangle we have to face today, yeah? And what I found really interesting in the paper is that 
uh, uh, in reality, we still have very little insight at the macro level about this dealer balance sheet capacity. You know, every bank at the individual level, uh, you know, basically determines how much uh, risk capital they allocate to this uh, dealership activity. Okay, and this is about uh, you know how risk models work, internal risk management combined with the regulatory framework. But on having a kind of macro understanding of how the dealer balance sheet capacity kind of influences volatility, liquidity, and this triangle that goes in every direction, actually. I think that's really important. And what the paper does, and I find it really exciting also for us as central banks, is kind of propose an empirical measure of how dealer balance sheet capacity varies over time and kind of can hit uh, it's, it's limit, and its limit, for example, is the level of March 20, yeah, where we know that at that point in time the system broke down. And so how far are we uh, from the point where the system breaks down? And I think that's really important. If I could, just the, the difference between resilience and liquidity, I think sometimes people will quickly use those terms somewhat interchangeably. But uh, in my remarks, I mentioned that what this interagency working group has been focused on has been treasury market resilience. And I, I guess from my perspective, I, I don't see how you can have a robust, liquid, consistently liquid market if it's not resilient. Yeah. So to me, it's, it's a necessary but not sufficient condition to have a liquid treasury market is that you need to shore up its resilience. That's been the focus of this work, and I, I fully agree. I mean, there are trade-offs everywhere you look here, yeah. right, but from regulatory policy, um, I, um, from a banking regulator policy, securities regulator policy, there are, there's a dial. And I, I think the challenge that the official sector has globally is calibrating that correctly, knowing how far to turn it. Because it's easy to turn it one way or the other. And I'm pretty sure if you turn it one way too hard, you're gonna break things. You turn it the other way too hard, you're gonna break other things. Uh, it, it's figuring out how, how to do that reliable, in, in a way over time, that meets the needs of the financial system as it exists at that time and not being static. Thank you. That is very interesting, Josh, when you also say um, the focus, the, the resiliency versus uh, liquidity, and I, I, I see your point there. And it makes me just think, uh, Alexandre, in your introductory remarks, you did discuss, I think, what goes to resiliency. Um, there are certain preconditions for uh, promoting um, functioning, well-functioning, well-liquid markets. So, so I'm thinking, as you say, speak to, you point to the resilience, I'm thinking about, um, that's an important point that you, you made, uh, uh, Alexandre. Could you elaborate a little bit more on, yeah, on that? Well, no, definitely, I mean, uh, and, and in these countries that I reported today, if I may say so, I mean, we've, we've seen lots of steps being taken over the years. I think the most important one is the macroeconomic policy frameworks, right? Uh, as uh, you were saying, I mean, you cannot have liquidity without resilience. Uh, perhaps it's not sufficient, but it's, uh, it's a necessary condition. So we have made progress with implementation of inflation targeting, with fiscal consolidation, with fiscal rules in, in the, the region that sort of keeps things under control, even if they don't look like in, in, the, in episodes. But, uh, Recently, I, I would say Latin America is doing uh, quite well with strong currencies with very little impact so far on financial stability from this global tightening cycle. But yes, I mean, uh, having done what they did, I mean, it's not just to, to stop there and, uh, and uh, call the day because there are uh, issues that they need to continue to do. For example, to widening the investors base. Uh, it's important, the ancillary markets some countries have very well developed derivative markets like Brazil, Mexico, but maybe still you have to, to work on that. So repo markets uh, to provide uh, liquidity. And I think when it comes to emerging markets, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, to, to react. I mean, you need some strong institutions to, to provide liquidity to solve in that market because if you don't have like a strong fiscal framework, then any liquidity, uh, leg legitimate liquidity uh, intervention will be perceived as monetary financing. Mm -hmm. I know you had all these restrictions on 
de jure, but de facto, even if you don't have the restriction, if you do that, I mean, if you try to, to provide liquidity to calm down sovereign debt markets, when you have, say, issues about that sustainability, then uh, communication will be very difficult, if not impossible. Josh, I wanted to turn to you on transparency, which is a, a very strong theme that came through in your remarks and also has, has come up a little bit here from all of you. Um, I mean, Iman, you said predictability is important, but also some agility perhaps to, to respond. Um, Alexander, you mentioned that uh, predictability has been very important for the debt, evolution of debt management strategies in, in Latin America versus being opportunistic and how that has supported market. And, but, and Joyce, but you mentioned here that you said that Treasury has also been responsive to adjusting. So, so Josh, how do you, um, you know, how do you look at this trade-off between predictability yet some agility to respond, and how do you build that in to your thinking? Yeah, no, it's a good question. I, I guess I'd take it in two different ways. One is transparency in our decision making, and second is transparency in the market. Do people know where the market is at any given time? So from our decision making process, what we, what we try to do is communicate on a pretty predictable cadence, so each quarter as part of what we call our quarterly refunding. We make, a, on a pretty predictable schedule, announcements about our plans over the coming quarter and quarters, about steps we plan to take, things we're thinking about from a debt management perspective. We try to provide as much insight as we can at the time based on what we know. I'll give a, one simple example would be, when, if you go back to uh, early May, when we announced we were, doing, we were intending to conduct buybacks starting at some point next year, what we did is we put out a, uh, a slide deck in association with this, not just saying a sentence, we plan to do buybacks, good luck, I'd like the whole market to guess how we're planning to do this. <laughs> we shared about half a dozen slides saying, here's our current state of thinking. Here's what we know, here's what we don't know, here's what we need to answer before we do this, facilitate better discussion. So to me, it, it's the more predictable our behavior is, the more... Exactly, <laughs> exactly. So, so the more predictable our behavior is, the more transparent it is. And I don't want predictability to be, to be taken as what we're going on autopilot. We are certainly responsive to market dynamics. Um, we think we get paid for that from a liquidity perspective. I think from a, a post-trade perspective, so this would be this trace data I was referring to, you will often get the question, uh, what are the benefits of transparency? Mm -hmm. we, 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 we hear a lot of risks uh, in, in a lot of our outreach. Um, to me, it's a, it's a few things. It's giving investors confidence that they know where prices are, where the market is, in particular in times of stress. So if I asked you know, any active participant in the treasury market, where's the on-the-run 10-year note today? They know. If I asked them, where is this very aged 7-year note? They roughly know. Um, in times of stress, I, I think if you ask that same question, to your point, when depth was $12 million in March of 2020, you ask people, where is the market for this seven-year note, this off the run seven-year note? You might have gotten a very different answer. And so there might be some benefits, especially in times of stress, to providing greater transparency into, into where pricing, or, uh, pricing is. Um, it could expand uh, the supply of liquidity, lower end costs for end users, provide risk managers with a better set of tools. Um, to set internal risk limits, for clearing houses to manage their risk if there is actual trade level data out there. Um, you can better manage your execution, assess execution quality. So if you know where the market is, you can not just look at a quote that you're getting from an end of day price provider, but you can actually get a pretty good sense of how you did versus that day's activity. Um, I think there are risks here too, so I, I don't think we're um, ignorant of those risks. Um, so uh, the Undersecretary for Domestic Finance uh, put it, I thought, nicely, our goal is to walk, not run here. Uh, we don't want to get too far ahead in terms of providing post-trade transparency because there's a risk that if we provide too much detail and we do it too quickly, uh, especially in less liquid segments of the Treasury market, the concern is that a dealer, out of concerns, they're going to be front-run before they can get out of that position 
uh, that there'll be too much information provided, they're going to be less willing to serve as a market maker. And as you rightly pointed out, like market making is in short supply globally these days. So I think we, we want to ensure that any decision that we make keeps that potential cost in mind, which is this walk, not run approach mm -hmm. that we're taking. So, um, Imen, um, if I can come back to you um, and your points about um, policy interventions to preserve monetary policy transmission. Um, and you have done a lot <laughs> at the ECB and in the Euro area. So, um, just a couple of, of questions on that. Are there, are there things that you, looking back over time, and maybe it's too early, but just some initial thoughts, um, are there lessons learned, anything you could have done differently um, based on what you learned at, uh, from um, mm. the measures? And then um, how do you see, like, what are the trade-offs uh, of designing the policy response to address fragmentation issues to support smooth liquidity and market functioning? No, thanks very much for the question, Anna, because I think it's exactly about these policy trade-offs that also were mentioned uh, by, by Josh more globally. And, and I think when we had to design, and I was really very close to that, um, both the PEP and then the TPI, all these policy trade-offs came out you know, very, very clearly. So if you go back on the two instruments, uh, uh, as I said, you have on the one hand this PEP that is a really massive but state contingent, time-limited uh, instrument okay, to face a very exceptional shock, as you said, Alexandre. Uh, and this is why I think some of the usual you know, side effects maybe don't apply, yeah, uh, basically, uh, and it was completely unconditional in, in, in our case. Um, and on the other hand, you have the TPI that is this permanent insurance mechanism. Yeah, it's always there and it aims to actually coordinate, um, if you want, the actions of market participants a bit in advance so that we don't fall into a bad equilibrium. Okay, so that's a bit how the tool is supposed to operate. And I think, you know, we had a lot of discussions about what's the best approach, yeah. Uh, what's the best approach between these two types of things? And I think if you wait too long before you intervene, so that, that's basically if you say every crisis is different, so let's, let's see how the crisis looks like and then we come up with something and, and hopefully it works, you run the risk of having really too much to do at that point in time to be effective, yeah. And I think standing tools uh, are you really useful to avoid this risk, especially if they address vulnerabilities that are really well known to us. And, and I think in the euro area, we learned the hard way uh, during the sovereign crisis about these vulnerabilities and these kind of fault lines in the financial system and, and the euro area fabric that can you know, flare up again. Yeah. And so I think the presence of standing tools uh, is useful, but of course you have the question of how do you manage this possible unwanted side effects yeah, that come with the existence of a permanent insurance mechanism. Yeah? And I think there it's really at two levels. One is clearly in the design of these instruments. You have to preserve the right set of incentives for all actors across the financial system. We have tried to do this with the introduction of conditionality, with the fact that we've made clear that this is to address uh, disruptions that are not linked to country fundamentals, so they are not homegrown, uh, these functions. And, and also uh, in terms of uh, monitoring, that's the other thing, that when you use these tools, you have to, uh, and even when you have them in place, carefully monitor the side effects. But I agree that, you know, today, I think the difficulty is that in all this trade-off, we really cannot anticipate all the risks, yeah? And some come from completely unexpected corners. I mean, we had the health, you know, the pandemic was a health crisis. I can very well imagine tomorrow that at some point we can have a climate crisis that has an impact, you know, on the financial system in a way. And so I think in any case, we need to keep uh, basically our agility to come back to that, to tackle shocks that, that we cannot predict, yeah? Thank you. Alexandra, um, may, maybe just one more question and then I'll turn it over to the audience. Um, so, um, Alexandra, just, um, I mean, you have a lot of experience uh, looking across uh, um, 
the countries, uh, countries that you sp spoke about, but also when you, with that experience and very direct experience that you have in your different roles and in your current <laughs> role where you also look, where you look at different countries um, here. Um, I was wondering if, so what happens at a, like what happens to markets at the time of stress and, and is the optimal policy response dependent on um, the characteristics of, of that market, where they are in terms of how much they have built up uh, resilience, so to say, um, and, and where they are in the policy cycle? Yeah, well, I think this is uh, absolutely relevant to, to limit and to define the, the, the optimal policy, or the policy response in general, but the optimal policy response, of course, I mean, depending on the development of your institutions, you have more uh, sort of leeway to, to intervene in times of stress without having to deal with the issues that we just mentioned, like uh, confusing uh, a genuine uh, liquidity intervention in, in, in sovereign debt markets with uh, monetary financing, uh, financing uh, of the government. Uh, the development of your, your domestic markets uh, is, is quite uh, relevant for defining your, your toolbox. I mean, where you, there are some countries in the, in the region we had very well developed derivatives markets, so probably you'll be using this market to intervene when, uh, when you have acute uh, stress in, in terms of liquidity, in solving that market, on foreign exchange. Uh, and then there is a characteristic of uh, emerging markets. You know that uh, not this, this uh, latest uh, round, but uh, in general what we have is uh, when we have uh, uh, stress in fixed income markets, uh, it, this goes hand in hand with uh, stress in the foreign exchange market. So sometimes you intervene in foreign exchange markets, so you, you do away with whatever is, is pressuring that, uh, that market over and above uh, what would be normal functioning. And then this sort of calms down the uh, sovereign debt that market. So depending on the nature, uh, the uh, quality of your institutions, the development of your markets, uh, it will be defining your, your response. And then the origin of the shock, as we just discussed, I think is quite important. If it's homegrown, then it's more difficult, it's trickier for, for, for instance, central banks to step in and, and, and resolve a liquidity crisis in sovereign debt markets. If it's an external one like COVID, I mean, it's extreme, external, so you check all the boxes, then, I mean, everybody got away with, uh, with uh, interventions, I would say, even the mature markets. So, uh, yeah, uh, definitely the policy setting, the institutions, the nature of the shock define, I mean, the optimal policy response. Thank you, and thank you for making the point that, of course, uh, we focus on sovereign debt markets, but uh, sometimes that can also be accompanied by stress in the foreign exchange market, which perhaps we don't focus on much. So that's an important point. So we have a few minutes for questions from the audience. I do see two hands already, three. Um, All right, thank you. Uh, my name is Kai Afai, researcher at the Bank of France, and I have a question regarding the buybacks um, that Josh mentioned. So Brazil conducted official buybacks in the past, and they usually paid a certain premium to extract their debt from the market, and they tended to do this during good macroeconomic circumstances, which could be interpreted to making, these, to making their bonds a bit more state contingent, right? And I was wondering what your view is on this. Are you planning also pay certain premium to market participants, to investors, to extract these bonds? Are you really only targeting liquidity objectives and like keep the potential premium as close to zero as possible? That's a good question. So um, I'd say by and large we would expect, if the reason we're doing these buybacks is, uh, one of the two reasons we've laid out is this liquidity support measure. Um, I'm struck by, you know, from my time here at the Fed and hearing how the ECB thought of this as well, the difference between how the monetary authorities and fiscal authorities think about buying government debt, it's all the same inputs, it's a lot of the same outputs, but it's a very different motivation, right? And it leads you to actually some pretty significantly different decisions. So QE, I think of as the, the extreme other example, completely price insensitive. 
you've got to buy, you're driving yields down. In fact, you know, to some extent, you want to be front run. You want the market to do a lot of the work for you, you want yields to be lower. Um, I think my way of thinking about this from our perspective, that, that is not what we're doing in, in, in any way. That is not our intent here. Our intent here is to say, if you are a, an active market maker in the treasury market, know that treasury will be coming through with some regularity, buying treasury securities and using price signals to tell us which treasury securities have, um, are, are kind of you know, less favored by the market or are having um, perhaps liquidity challenges or otherwise appear cheap. So, uh, you know, one of the biggest open decisions, I guess, not even decision, but the communication points that we have remaining um, is to, to better communicate how we're going to measure success for this program. Um, it's pretty tough to say ex ante. But we would sit here today and say, uh, as measured by the market mid at the close of each buyback operation, we're going to measure our realized prices, and that's the sole measure. I, I don't think that's where we're going to be. But some combination of execution quality, improved, uh, realized improvement in liquidity. Um, you know, Joyce had, I think, the, the very helpful chart up of like, uh, pricing dislocations or spline errors. I'd like to see what happens there. Um, but, and, and qualitative feedback, frankly, from market participants. Are these helping? Um, I, I, I continue to go back to, like, our, my, our, our driver in buybacks is, I guess, starts from the Hippocratic Oath, right? This is, this is a first do no harm thing. Um, that's why we're doing it. Yeah, thank you very much, Matthias Thiemann, Sciences Po Paris. Uh, wonderful panel to start the event. I have um, a question on financial instability and non-bank financial institutions, because a lot of what I have heard today could be reframed and rephrased as we see increasing turbulences in treasury markets because large, highly leveraged non-bank financial institutions take increasingly positions that are low return but high volume, and when they suddenly things happen, then they have to unbiden them. And what's happening then is that the treasury market goes haywire, and then the Fed has to intervene. And that has a lot of uh, implications for the risk taking of these large non-bank financial institutions. Namely, they know that the central bank will come in and make sure that they don't lose or that the thing doesn't go down the train. So what, what, what do you think about the unexpected consequences of central bank actions backing these treasury markets for these non-bank financial institutions and their risk-taking behavior? Thank you. Well, maybe I try from, from this camp, I mean, <laughs> more, more general. I think you, uh, I, I tend to agree with you, I mean, this is a, a, a quarter of the global financial system, which is, uh, to my mind, uh, under-regulated uh, in, in, um, uh, in, in a few key respects. Um, I think there is an effort for that. The BIS has been vocal on this issue, as you may know. I mean, and the concern here is the size is 50% of the global financial system, 220, north of $225 trillion under management this in this uh, non-bank financial intermediaries or market-based finance, as you, as you may call. So uh, the issues here of uh, potential liquidity mismatches and uh, hidden leverage are, are real. So I think what, uh, what the FSB and specifically the BIS is advocating for is sort of a system-wide perspective towards this, uh, this uh, kind of institutions. Uh, along the lines of what we had for the banking system after the great financial crisis, so this macroprudential view on, on the system. So I think the discussion is there, and uh, this, is a, this, is a, this is an important issue that can have repercussion, as you mentioned, to the most mature markets in the world. If I could put in a one-second shameless plug for the work of the Financial Stability Oversight Council, um, several, two of their three top priorities over the last several years have been treasury market resilience and non-bank financial intermediation. So, shameless plug, you know, go to the FSOC website. There's a ton there for you. Yeah, but 
maybe if I may, I mean, I think I'm, I'm, I'm with Alexandre on that, that I think that it's been a long-standing vulnerability. I mean, when I was at the FSB in 2012-13, we had, uh, you know, published the first report on shadow banking, yeah? And I think, okay, every year there's a little bit more incrementally, but there isn't really a sea change in kind of, uh, at least the prudential regulation of non-bank financial institution, yeah? And, and so I, I think it's not easy because I recognize that they are very different animals. So the question, for example, highlighted this kind of, I don't know if you were referring to basis trades, but all these people that take relative value positions that are, you know, basically exactly small profit, but very large uh, 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 size. And this is very different from an insurance company, yeah, which is also a non-bank financial institution, and from a pension fund that is also in BFI, and we had an LDI crisis in the UK. So I think that's part of the difficulty is how do you address the diversity of this crowd, so to speak, uh, with targeted measure from the supervisory side. But clearly from the central bank perspective, where I, you know, kind of worry is that uh, if there is no strong first line of defense in terms of a regulatory policy, it means that indeed central banks are a bit left to clean up the mess. Yeah. Yep. Can I just add, because I think Eamon made, Eamon made this point as well, like, you know, what is that balance with regulation? Because I feel like so much of the dialogue goes back to well, what are the dealers doing and the yeah. GSIBs, and that's such a small part of the market right now. So, you know, 75% of the market making is high frequency trading, but even if you look at the growth of, you know, alternative asset classes that are outside of the traditional asset classes, like that's a $26 trillion market now that is not regulated. And um, you would think that, you know, perhaps there was more caution about this, but the areas that seem to be growing the fastest are actually private credit and private equity. And so just kind of saying, well, let's go back to the dealer balance sheet and the GSIBs for what they can do. That's really just not you know, a solution given the way that the market structure has transformed. Thank you very much. Um, this was very interesting. And I think we are at time. So there is a coffee break, of course. So um, brief, a brief coffee break so we can have some bilateral discussions are welcome. Of course, you can discuss with the panelists then as well. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciated your time. OK, welcome back. Our next program highlight is a fireside chat on monetary policy, lessons, and challenges. And the speaker is John Williams. John is the president and chief executive officer of the New York Fed. In that capacity, he serves as the vice chair and a permanent voting member of the Federal Open Market Committee. Before joining the New York Fed in 2018, John Williams was the president and CEO of the San Francisco Fed which he first joined in 2012 and subsequently served as research director. He began his career as an economist at the Federal Reserve's Board of Governors, and he's also had roles at the White House Council of Economic Advisors and Stanford University's Graduate School of Business. So John, thank you for being here. Um, the moderator today is Colby Smith, uh, Colby is the U.S. economics editor of the Financial Times. She previously covered U.S. rates, foreign exchange, and Latin America for the FT's markets team in New York. She's written for the FT Alphaville, and prior to the FT, she worked at The Economist and at Bloomberg. She holds a bachelor's degree from Brown University and a master's degree from the University of Cambridge. So let's begin. Welcome. Well, thank you so much for that introduction and, and for having us today. I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. Um, before I get going, just a quick uh, note on programming. So um, I'll have some questions of my own for the first 20, 25 minutes or so, and then we'll open it up to audience Q&A. So there are mics to pass around. So, so get thinking now um, before we get going. Um, but I, I want to start here with inflation, unsurprisingly. Um, it was around this time last year that I, I think it's safe to say that jaws collectively dropped when uh, the latest CPI report showed that annual headline inflation had surpassed 9%. And I know people were you know, anticipating some increase um, 
you know, heading into the year, but, but above 9% was something I think people were pretty surprised to see. Um, and it felt like a moment in which, you know, inflation fears really started to percolate. We've come a long way since then, thankfully, and headline inflation has, has come down from that level. But no matter what core metric you look at, uh, it, it's clear that the inflation problem is still with us. So I'm curious how you would assess the progress we've seen so far in terms of the dis disinflationary process. Are you content with, with what we're seeing? Well, obviously, I'm not content with where inflation is. As you said, it's far too high. Uh, it doesn't matter how you measure it or look at it overall core or anything. Uh, inflation is still well above our 2% uh, longer run goal. It's obviously the, still the number one focus for monetary policy is to restore price stability. Uh, and so when you, you asked, you took us back to how inflation was much higher a year ago. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the uh, PCE, or Personal Consumption Expenditures Price Index, because that's what our, our, um, you know, our 2% target is defined against that. But of course, it's the same for the CPI, what I'm about to say. I mean, a number of factors caused inflation to rise dramatically uh, last year. Uh, they included uh, effects of the pandemic on the supply and demand side of the economy. They included effects on food and energy prices both because of the pandemic, but also because Russia's war in Ukraine. Uh, and a lot of things you know, were coming together. And it was, a, to me at least, a, a surprise about how high uh, core inflation and how persistent core inflation uh, ended up being. But as you said, it's a, it's a year later. We've seen overall inflation come down to around 4%, still high, but you know, from a peak of 7% to 4% is, uh, you know, uh, is progress. But honestly, a lot of that progress was what you know, many of us were expecting. So energy prices didn't keep increasing rapidly. In fact, they've, they've fallen, gas prices have fallen. Food inflation is now slowing. Uh, uh, and we're seeing, uh, we've seen some of the uh, reduction in inflation rates of, core, of, of goods prices. Mm -hmm. And those were all things we, as we came out of the pandemic, as we move forward, we expected those to happen. But what we've also seen, as you pointed out, is that core inflation, no matter how you measure it, uh, has may, has been um, you know been very high, uh, around four and a half percent or something. And I think here all of, I think a lot of our analysis is well, what's happening there? Is this just that inflation is more persistent, or are there other things going on? And I would say I would I would say one very important driver of core inflation. Again, if you look at a median or a trim mean, you look at just core measures, is that the shelter inflation has been just very high. Uh, that's rents, that's owner equivalent rents, it's all the factors that go into that. So when I think about what's happening on the disinflationary process, I think really the, the two pieces that are still kind of right in front of us, one is the shelter inflation, uh, which is you know, very important, but also we are now seeing signs that it's improving. We all learned new data, data sets mm -hmm. in the last few years, and one of those is the, the rents on new leases that were just signed. That data continues to show a slowdown in inflation of rents, and that, will show up in the, that is showing up in the official statistics. And even in the category of core services, ex excluding mm -hmm. shelter, we're seeing some slowing of inflation. So, you know, I think a lot of the special factors associated with the pandemic have rec are receding. Uh, that that showed up in the supply chain issues. That so, so showed up in uh, energy, food, er food and energy prices, and goods prices. Now we're starting to see the improvement in the shelter prices, uh, shelter inflation. To me, the the piece that we still have to get right uh, in terms of monetary policy is making sure we're bringing supply and demand back in balance. Because this is an economy that still has very strong demand very strong demand for labor. And until we get all of that together, the supply and demand back in balance, uh, we're, you know, it's going to take all of that happening really to see all of the pieces of inflation come back down to levels consistent with 2%. On housing inflation, though, I think something that's really been notable just in, in recent months, frankly, is the stabilization of the housing market. Yeah. So even though mortgage rates are higher than they were a year ago, uh, we're starting to see in some regions prices rise um, to a certain extent, um, rental costs are up uh, in certain markets. Um, of course, it's not the same kind of increase that uh, were, you know, these eye-watering levels that we, we saw in the past year, but it's by no means, um, you know, the retreat I think some would have anticipated at this time. And, and I guess I'm just I'm wondering how, you know, concerning that is for you. Does that stymie the, the process um, to get inflation down to a certain extent? Does it mean we're in for a bumpier ride here? 
Well, I think it is it is a, a bit of a surprise to see the housing market kind of bounce back a bit after it, uh, you know a lot of those measures slowed with the higher mortgage rates. It's not completely surprising that it would stabilize. Mm -hmm. Mortgage rates rise, the market adjusts to that and moves forward. But we definitely, like you said, have seen some signs of improvement and it's an area, uh, obviously, watch, uh, uh, you know, I watch along with all the other parts of the economy. I think to me it's, it's not so worrisome that the housing market has rebounded somewhat. It's because I'm focused on the big, kind of like the bigger mm -hmm. picture. How does it all fit together? Housing is a, is a, a very interest sensitive and, a, and an important part of our economy, but it's not a big part of our economy if you think about GDP and, and jobs. So it's really making sure, understanding what's happening in the housing sector uh, in the context of what's happening with consumer spending, business spending, and, uh, and all the other components. In terms of the shelter costs there, I mean, clearly, as you said, the you know, dramatic rise in shelter costs that we saw during the pandemic, that growth rate of, 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 of rent increases is, is slowing. I don't think that what we're seeing in, in the housing market today is suge suggesting that we're gonna see this you know, rampant uh, rent inflation again. But it is something that, it's another sign that the, you know, the underlying demand in our economy is, uh, is pretty resilient, and not just in housing, but in general. Uh, the economy is, is actually handled. The interest rates the increases that have happened uh, you know, reasonably well. The economy is continuing to grow, and you have to take all that into account in thinking about you know, what's going to happen with inflation and, and other things. Does that suggest that we're past the peak drag, though, when it comes to interest rate sensitive sectors and in, in, in monetary policy? And, and what does that also imply about mo the policy lags that we think about when sure. it comes to policy. You know, it's funny, though, this, the policy lags is, is like the topic, uh, yeah. the, uh, <laughs> not surprising, given that you know, we and other central banks raise interest rates so much in the last year, or year and a half. Uh, I, I think that one thing that's missing in, in some of the commentary is the, sen the, the concept that there might be a lag to monetary policy. In other words, you make a decision on a given day, and then you wait you know, 18 months, and then the economy responds. Well, clearly, that's not how it works. In the U.S., because we have a very more, uh, fixed rate mortgage market, unlike other countries, the mortgage rates move very quickly in response to policy actions and expectations of policy actions. Those mortgage rates affect housing activity almost immediately. There's not much of a lag uh, in that market. There's not, in certain other interest sensitive uh, sectors, including energy and others, you don't see that much of a lag. Where I think you see the lag typically is what you know, macroeconomists would say in the general equilibrium effect. So mm -hmm. you have a, if you have, you have interest sensitive sectors slow you know, relative to where they were, that means less income in the economy, that means consumers will spend less, and over time, basically the, inter the, effect, the direct effect on the interest uh, sensitive sectors and broadens to the general economy. So I think that when we think of the lagged effects, it's really about this broadening effect of, of, of lower demand or slower growth in the economy. And you know, most, most estimates say that that peak effect you know, mm -hmm. typically might take a year or two to, to be uh, fully felt. But it's not because there's kind of one lag right. uh, parameter. There's a, a wide range of, of, of factors. Uh, in, in terms of you know, thinking about um, housing, I just want to make one other point is I think you know, one of the lessons of the pandemic is that there have been structural changes to supply and demand. Fortunately, it seems to be more to demand than mm -hmm. supply. We've seen labor force participation, you know, return at least for uh, 25 to 54 year olds to levels that we saw before the pandemic. We've seen, you know, other factors in the economy kind of maybe normalize on the supply side, including supply chain uh, disruptions and bottlenecks. But on demand, you know, a hypothesis I think is gaining some support is the demand for housing is just higher than it was in 2019. So maybe we're not gonna go back to the same equilibrium that we were in because people are working from home more, they're, they're setting up home offices and other things. So one of the things as a you know, uh, student of the economy is you, you kind of look at its historical be behavior, but you also have to think about what might have changed and how that might show up in the data. And at least my hypothesis on housing is uh, some of that strong demand is just the underlying demand is still out there for more for, for more housing for reasons associated with the pandemic. Right, right. I was going to save this question towards the end because I know it's a, a passion of yours, our you star. Yeah, star. You know, I was setting you up with that, right? That whole <laughs> thing were, about you were. <laughs> well, you, your grand conclusion when you when you start resumed the estimates was that n nothing much had changed in terms of pandemic and and the natural rate of interest. And when you think about uh, the pandemic and the shock caused by the war in Ukraine as well. I'm, I'm, I'm just curious if that conclusion surprised you in any way and, and how you think about confidence levels 
in that, in that model? Well, I think it, it, it actually did surprise me a, a bit because of the logic of the model that, you know, I, I worked on for now over 20 years with uh, Catherine Holson and, and Thomas Laubach is that the estimates of this R star, the natural rate of interest, is, is, which is trying to capture the longer term real interest rate that the economy naturally gravitates to in, a, in, you know, in kind of a, a, a stable economy, uh, a trend growth way. Um, you, think, you think about the very strong demand we've seen over the last few years. We've seen huge fiscal support. We've seen signs of you know, you know, high inf obviously mm -hmm. high inflation, a lot of other factors. So the logic of the model is we've seen very strong demand. Some of it's probably structural, some of it's cyclical, and the model would tell you that that's, that's going to tell you that you know, maybe there's a structurally higher real interest rate. So that's all in the model. So that's where I kind of expected this to come out. But there were two factors that worked against that in the US um, estimates, and they showed up in the, the Euro area estimates and the estimates for Canada as well. So one is our estimates of trend growth in the economy uh, for all three of these economies came, came down mm -hmm. since 2019. Um, so we're basically seeing an economy that relative to three, four years ago has a slower trend growth. Well, trend growth in our model it's associated with investment demand, and, and it basically means less demand for investment relative to savings, a little lower neutral interest rate. So that's one factor that we, we came up with. That's because it counters the higher R star. Mm -hmm. The other is, at least in our model, it's showing that a lot of the factors that boosted demand a lot in 20, and especially 2021, have been reversing. In other words, the economy actually hasn't gotten more and more fiscal stimulus, it got, as an example, mm -hmm. it got a big boost to growth, but then growth then settled back down to levels closer to trend or even below trend. So again, it's it, part of the, you know, yes, we had a strong economy, yes, that showed up in inflation, but a lot of those effects, at least according to this model, and I know mm -hmm. I'm, I'm like consulting it like a, you know, uh, um, uh, as if it were a person, but uh, the, uh, not that it isn't a person, the, uh, uh, but that, uh, you know, there's a lot of different factors that are going on. The last thing I'll say is, you know, you think about what are the drivers of neutral interest rates uh, around the world. There's been a lot of papers on this. They tend to be longer term demographics, birth rates, uh, you know, longevity. They tend to be things about longer term productivity or income growth. Uh, and those factors, at least from our analysis, I think, and others, they haven't fundamentally changed since 2019. Now, mm -hmm. everyone's going to say, but what about AI? What about right. this and that? But so far, in the data through the first quarter of this year, those, at least those factors haven't had a, a big influence. How do the conclusions of the model you know, affect your approach to the current inflation situation that we're in today? Do you feel a sense of complacency is maybe the wrong word, but relief that at the end of the day, your expectation is that this inflation problem is a temporary one and it will fade. Well, I, I don't think the inflation problem is, is, is inherently temporary, mm -hmm. it, whether it's temporary or not, and I know so you didn't use the other T word, transitory, <laughs> uh, but whether it is temporary or not is really up to us and other central banks in each of their countries. I mean, I am a believer in Milton Friedman's adage that, you know, in, inflation is a monetary phenomenon in the, in the long run. And so whether inflation, pers how long inflation persists and how long it stays, it really depends on the actions that we take at the FOMC and obviously in other countries that central banks take. I am, um, you, I would say there is, you know, some signs that, you know, things are, fa some, some favorable signs. One is, is I, it does appear that, at least so far, that longer run structural factors haven't you know, fundamentally changed some of the trade-offs that we face in terms of R star or other factors of the labor market, but also that inflation expectations, of, especially in the United States, which I follow closely, have been remarkably well anchored. Now, not just out at 30 years, or, you know, 50 years, or 100 years out mm -hmm. there, but actually even in the shorter, we do a survey here, a survey of consumer expectations, and we, t we ask people about one year ahead, three year ahead, and now five year ahead in ex inflation expectations. And what we've seen is the three year ahead moved up a little bit, but relatively little, and now has retraced that. It's back to where levels consistent with what we saw before the pandemic. And even the one year ahead, which like in the Michigan survey and other surveys, tends to follow gas prices and mm -hmm. things like that. We saw that surge, absolutely we did, but now we've seen that come down. 
pretty, pretty significantly, both in our survey and the Michigan survey. So, in, and and in, in a way that I think confirms that we do have well-anchored, uh, longer-run inflation expectations. So those are some of the more favorable signs, I guess, I see structurally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, we still have our work cut out for us in terms of getting supply and demand in balance, getting inflation to 2%, uh, but those factors, I think, uh, work in our favor. In terms of the work necessary here, um, the minutes uh, that were out from the June meeting just couple hours ago uh, indicated that some officials favored a 25 basis point hike at the June meeting. Now, of course, this was a unanimous decision to, to take a breather and forego that increase. Um, but I'm curious if, if you were in that camp who favored the 25 basis point hike, if you have sympathy for that view at all? <laughs> I 110% support the decision we made. Uh, and, uh, and for the reasons we made it. I, uh, mm -hmm. I'm uh, sincere about that. I think, you know, we went through a period last year, which I also fully supported, of, uh, you know, very quickly, or I think the word was expeditiously yes, last year, <laughs> uh, you know, moved interest rates from what was clearly a very accommodative stance by any measure to one that first got us back to something close to uh, neutral in terms of, um, uh, you know, the stance of policy and then ultimately to, you know, to what is now, I think, uh, a restrictive stance of policy. So, I, you know, the, but when you think about that path, it was, you know, rapid rate increases, but then we slowed them. We went from 75 mm -hmm. to 50 to 25. And, and now as we've gotten closer to what seems to be the peak rate, don't know exactly yeah. what that number is, but we're closer to it. You know, the idea of slowing down the pace of rate increases and continuing to slow the pace of rate, pace of rate increases makes sense. Uh, getting some more data, getting some more information about how the economy is performing, how the past effects of monetary policy uh, or affecting economic activity and inflation, and then basically having a meeting by meeting uh, decision about you know how to adjust policy. As you as you saw in the economic projections, you know the vast majority of the committee members see us you know raising rates uh, again later this year. Uh, and uh, but at the same time, so I think we still have more work to mm. do. I, I agree with that. However, it also makes sense to collect more information and get the totality of the data, and some people say, like, data, what do you mean? Are you looking at this or this or this? And my answer is yes and everything else. So really capturing not only what's the new information coming through, you know, between the meetings, but also how does that inform kind of our understanding of the factors of supply and demand in the economy, the factors driving inflation, and how does that all fit together in thinking about the setting of policy, which obviously, you know, when we meet, we can, we can make those decisions. What gave you confidence, and, and I asked Chair Powell a version of this question at the most recent press conference, but what, what gave you the confidence that just taking a break uh, and, and waiting to see this uh, more data come through would not be counterproductive in any way? That sure, it could be valuable to assess the incoming data, but it wouldn't actually work against the objective uh, of the Fed at the current moment. Well, I think that, you know, we think about monetary policy, I think there's, you know, two aspects, and they're both very important. Uh, I, not one or the other, but both. So one is the actual decisions we made. I mean, the decisions we've made all along uh, this, uh, you know, last 15 months or so have been critically important because we needed to get, we didn't need, just need to talk about interest rates mm -hmm. being higher, we need to get interest rates back uh, to a level that would, uh, you know, restore price stability. Uh, but at the same time, our communication uh, tools are, are just as important uh, to convey how we're viewing the economy, uh, what are the risks to the economic outlook, and what are the factors that influence, you know, the likely path of, of interest rates. So again, in this context that we are, we've been, we've raised interest rates, uh, you know, uh, I guess 10 times in a row, mm -hmm. I think is the right number. Uh, and then we can take some, uh, take some time uh, and uh, assess and uh, collect more information and then be able to act knowing that we also were, you know, communicated through our projections that we, we don't think we're done mm -hmm. uh, based on what we know. We don't know what the future will hold, but based on what we know, we don't think we're done. And obviously, we're absolutely committed to achieving the 2% inflation goal. So you think about the trade-off question there. You know, I think it's really about making the right decisions with the information you have. And, and I think also communicating that, you know, how we think the economy is going to perform, what the decisions, you know, may be in the future in the context of achieving uh, our 2% inflation goal. Is another 50 basis points worth of hikes, as the SEP suggests, your baseline? Well, I think you know I'm going to be data dependent mm -hmm. on what what the uh, what we what we need to do. I do think that you know I think that the last several weeks 
have been informative on data, I will say that. Uh, we've definitely seen, uh, uh, you know, a combination of pre, you mentioned the housing data, uh, that's been stronger than expected. Uh, we've seen the first quarter GDP come in uh, at about 2%, and mm -hmm. again, uh, signs of pretty strong resilience in the U.S. economy through the first quarter. We've seen, obviously, uh, uh, other data about you know, consumer spending slowing a bit, but also the data, you know, the data we've gotten on, on other uh, uh, other aspects. So I think that, you know, this, it, you know, people often ask the question, well, what are you going to learn mm -hmm. in, in six, six weeks, right? I mean, you know, how much do you learn? But it, you, we actually get, uh, I think, again, in the context of all the other information we ever had, good information about the two questions that I'm always thinking about. One is, are we getting s demand and supply in back into balance? Not overnight, but over time, are we getting there? And we've seen good progress on that, but we still have a ways to go. So watching that progress, then obviously watching the progress on, on inflation, is it moving consistent with what, you know, expectations and moving back to 2%. So it's about looking at both, you know, kind of looking at all the information, but on the lens of those kind of two basic questions. Mm -hmm. Are we getting supply and demand back in balance? Is inflation moving the right way? Based on what you see so far, uh, is your starting point a July move, and then you need to be convinced against that, or or how are you thinking about? So the, the way I, the, you know, again, I think that well, first of all, we have more data mm -hmm. uh, before uh, the next <laughs> meeting, uh, and also since I, a number of my uh, colleagues are at the New York Fed are in the room. I haven't even gotten any of the briefings yet. So how could I possibly opine right. about what monetary policy should be until the New York Fed team has come together, given me their perspectives? If I'm being serious, we have, you know, we're not in the FOMC mm -hmm. uh, prep um, uh, kind of, uh, uh, you know, kind of mode yet. We're you know, right. not at all. But going back to your question, you know, do, do we have more to do in terms of monetary policy? I think the incoming data support that hypothesis. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, um, you know, again, just be continuing to, to watch the data. The Fed isn't alone in its inflation fight, and we have the ECB, you know, responding aggressively, the BOE as well. Uh, but, but central banks are at different phases, I think, of their policy cycles, and we're now seeing uh, central banks move at different speeds in terms of mm -hmm. tightening. And, and I'm just curious what the implications are in, in your view of this right. and how you uh, factor that into your decisions about, uh, you know, U.S. policy decisions. Yeah, this is a really important question, a really important topic. I mean, we do get together every two months or even more frequently if needed, uh, and, and among the central banks uh, uh, around the world, uh, discussing how we see the economic situation, the various issues that we face, uh, and the, share, the, the, the shared uh, issues like inflation, which is mm -hmm. pretty common around most of the countries of the world, uh, and also how we think about policy. So when I think about, the, I think first of all, information sharing, understanding what's going on around the world, understanding how our decisions affect other countries and how their decisions affect us, uh, this is an important part, mm -hmm. part of policy making. Uh, in a way, I, you know, there was always a concern that if, if one set of central banks is going that way and the other cent a set of central banks is going a different direction, of course that could cr cr create some volatility or, or uh, in, in markets or things. But, but that's not really what we're seeing, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, tactically, certain central banks are making tactical decisions slightly differently. But most of the central banks, uh, not all, but most of the central banks are moving in the same direction. Mm -hmm. They're tightening policy uh, as appropriate for their inflation and economic circumstances. So, you know, again, you can, there are differences uh, between the different central banks tactically, but really fundamentally, we're all kind of facing similar situation. High inflation, the need to get monetary policy to bring inflation back down and do that in a way that, you know, uh, make sure that we restore price stability. Before turning to audience questions, just a, a final one on financial stability, because obviously the banking turmoil um, earlier this year uh, really, I, I think, uh, caught a lot of people off guard, but but also, you know, generated quite a forceful response from uh, government authorities. And, and I'm just wondering, as you think about uh, the Fed's objective in getting inflation down, um, but also the need to, you know, manage financial stability concerns. Do you see tension there um, in, in any way, shape, or form, any limitation as to how much the Fed can do if further banking stress, let's say, uh, crops up? 
So, you know, I, let me take a step back on this because it, I think it's a really important broad uh, question beyond the specifics of, of March or today, and that is you really, we have learned from the financial crisis and quite honestly other periods that when, if monetary policy is constrained in what it can do to achieve price stability, that actually undermines financial stability, undermines economic stability. So price stability is very, you know, it's the bedrock of stability, if you will. So we, we need to make sure as we think about regulation, as we think about uh, financial stability and, and prudential regulation and supervision, you think about all these things, you're thinking about it in the context of, a, of making sure the monetary policy can do its part, because it's really only the central bank that can own price stability in the long run. So you have to make sure that we have a system that, um, that supports that. What we saw in the financial crisis, of course, is that a breakdown in financial stability, of course, interfered with the achievement of our, of our macroeconomic objectives. Uh, so, I, so I guess my answer to your question when I think about these issues is we really need to have a financial system that is as, as stable and resilient uh, to, uh, and uh, vulnerability-free as mm -hmm. it can be, uh, not only because of the direct effects it has on uh, uh, kind of supporting economic stability, but also to make sure that we minimize as much as we can the trade-offs between achieving macroeconomic goals and, and financial stability goals. I actually think a lot of the reforms of the financial crisis were in extremely successful on that. They focus on capital, liquidity, a lot of other aspects of that, but those have paid enormous dividends. They paid dividends in 2020. I think they pay dividends even, uh, today as well. There are obviously lessons learned from right. the events of March, and we have to take that on and understand to make sure that you know uh, we understand where the, uh, you know where the vulnerabilities are and, and address those. But again, I go back to you know monetary policy needs to be able to do and uh, uh, be able to you know, focus on its objectives. We can do that. We have the ability, obviously, to, to adjust uh, interest rates as needed to do that. But whenever I think about what, you know, the answer to the question is, John, what do you do with the trade-off between mm -hmm. financial stability and monetary policy goals? I go back to say, we need to strengthen the resilience, strength, strengthen the robustness of our financial system so that to, to, to try our best to minimize those. It, it's probably impossible to make them go away in all circumstances mm -hmm. because you can think about uh, you know uh, the situations where there's some trade-off, but that's really how I, I think about. It. Does that mean you support stronger capital rules then for for banks? I mean, we've Chair Powell has talked about banks with 100 billion or more in, in assets. I, 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 right now, I you know I'm going to just say I think we need to look carefully at the lessons learned across the events of this year. Uh, I know we are doing that, inter, you know, both in the U.S. and internationally, mm -hmm. uh, but also think about the lessons learned from 2020 and and, and, uh, and other episodes uh, as well. But uh, so I'm not going to opine on what the answer is. Uh, but I, I, I should have said this earlier. I actually, you know, people often bring up the separation principle idea, mm -hmm. like can you separate monetary policy from financial stability? And of course, the answer is you can't do it in all circumstances. But you look at what happened in March in the U.S. I mean, clearly we had a an, you know issue in you know uh, in the banking system. Monetary policy needed to tighten monetary policy to uh, mm -hmm. to restore price stability. But we had this issue in the banking system, and the response, both by the Federal Reserve, the FDIC, the Treasury, everybody working together, was to do their very best to address it with bank you know, liquidity issues, the, mm -hmm. the new facility the Fed set up, um, the actions of the FDIC and other regulators to really address it with the, the, I would say, the prudential and the financial stability tools that they have so that we actually were, you know, did raise interest rates again uh, after that. We weren't constrained in our mm -hmm. monetary policy actions. So to me, that was a success in, in not that the world is ever completely financial stability or monetary policy, but success in saying, hey, we have a set of tools that addresses this. We have a set of tools that addresses this. Let's use the right tools for the right problem. Now, of course, there's always a spillover. I mean, we still don't know how much of a uh, effect will the um, you know events in March and uh, you know uh, resulting credit tightening affect the economy? Mm -hmm. But that's kind of more in the standard right. macro kind of right, right. issues. Absolutely. All right. Time for some questions. If anyone has any. Oh, they're going to have some. We have microphones, <laughs> and we just ask you to say who you. Okay. Why don't we start in the front then? In the front row. You get to start with the front row. <laughs> front and center. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Really fascinating thoughts. Um, I had a question on basically the future shape 
of the policy path. Okay, so we have this very stubborn, persistent uh, core inflation. Okay, and I think that the the market, uh, if you look at the shape uh, of of the the short term interest rates that the market anticipates, the market narrative is central banks will reach the terminal rate and then will very quickly or relatively quickly, you know, reverse and cut. Okay, and so you have a peak and then it goes down. What I understand from us central bankers is that we say we will reach the terminal rate and we will stay there for some time. So what is important is not only how high we, we go, but also how long we stay high, okay? And I was really interested about your thoughts on this question of the shape, whether we go like peak and then, and then down, which for what uh, the, the market says would be the case, and, and, and what we think is effective, which is this more flat part after, uh, after reaching the terminal rate. I really don't know which one would be you know, most effective, uh, also in terms of transmission of, of monetary policy. So, you know, it's interesting, if you had asked this question a few months ago, it would be a kind of more, in, uh, kind of in a way, even more interesting discussion because market participants, uh, based on market pricing, actually had us cutting rates later this year, right? You know, and much sooner than you know, FOMC participants had indicated in any of our communication. That isn't true anymore. I mean, really, market participants have kind of, you know, heard the message, seen our through our actions and our our, our words. You know that that's uh, and also given I think economic uh, developments that were you know that that's not the likely path from their view. They still have the rate cuts in in 24 and 25. Uh, but you know, I would translate that first to real real interest. Rates. Uh, if you look at the FOMC projections, the, the you know the from June, of course we have we have uh, you know the media. I'll just talk about the median dot has rate de, uh, rate cuts in 24 and in 25 because our forecasts have inflation coming down pretty quickly uh, to two and a half, or roughly two percent over the next two years. And so if you if you capped the funds rate at whatever that peak rate is, you're going to cause you know, real interest rates to go up and up and up, and that's inconsistent, I think, with kind of the economy going back to uh, kind of a steady state with low inflation. So in a real rate space, the way I read the markets, and I read the SEP, as, uh, the economic projections as well, is real rates actually stay relatively, uh, you know, say restrictive for quite some time. So in the real rate space, so inflation-adjusted real rates, uh, rates are actually are that flat kind of shape uh, in the restrictive, and by this I'm saying restrictive relative to a long run or a star, uh, but the nominal rates are, are falling. Now there is an open question, how quickly will inflation come down in 24, 25, we don't know. Uh, and the, you know, what happens with interest rates, I think of course will depend a lot on what happens with inflation along with other factors. In the blue chip survey of private forecasters, you know, pri uh, you know economists, the recent one, they asked them, why do you think the Fed's going to cut rates next year uh, or in, over the next two years? And the, 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 the number one answer was lower inflation. The number two answer was a weaker economy. Uh, so that's <laughs> not surprising, two factors you think affect uh, the path for interest rates. So to me, you know, I think that we have this longer period of, of restrictive real rates, and the, the nominal rates are just really a reflection of different views on how quickly inflation will come down. It's not really a problem from my point of view. If private sector forecasters think we're going to reach our 2% target faster than we do, well, that's, you know, we'll hopefully they're right. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. All right, here in the fourth row. Thank you very much. My name is Piroska Nagymohácsi from the London School of Economics. Um, this is a very global audience, Mr. President, so I'd like to ask uh, um, uh, something about the global role of the Federal Reserve System. What we saw during the pandemic was an enormously influential and helpful role of the uh, Federal, Syst Federal Reserve and actually the ECB uh, to help emerging markets with currencies from uh, repo operations. And you managed to put it in the context of the national mandate, which I think was so we look for an outsider, it's brilliant. Um, and it has worked fantastically. You don't, didn't even have to use it that much. It's just the deterrent um, uh, impact of this. How you see uh, the role of these facilities going forward in a peaceful time when we have 
big cross-border uh, banks which operate in, in different uh, major uh, monetary uh, areas. So, and, and how you see it, uh, can, can the rest of the world count on, on the continuation in case of a huge stress, God forbid, like the, the pandemic, a continuation also in a crisis of this uh, global facility? Uh, it's, a, it's a great question, actually a great couple of observations and a question in there because, you know, obviously the, uh, we all have national mandates, as you said, but when we're in a situation like we were all in, um, the, the decisions we make affect everybody else and their decisions affect us. And, you know, there was, a, you, I don't think it was a coordinated response, but there was a consistent response across major jurisdictions, uh, especially in, in, in central banking and monetary policy, but also in terms of, uh, you know, uh, other actions that were taken. And I think that's very helpful. Of course, fiscal policy ended up being the same as well, uh, but uh, that's not something that, that we control. So to, to the issue of, you know, what are the permanent kind of facilities or support for liquidity. I think there, there I have, you know, there's, there are facilities put in in 2020 in the U.S. and, you know, others can talk about other jurisdictions that were very specific to the cir circumstances we were dealing with. Uh, the drying up of liquidity, uh, you know, market dysfunction in, in certain areas. And they're hard to predict. They're, they're unusual. And in fact, by law, they have to be unusual and exigent, which means that they have to be unusual, but they also have to be immediate and can't rely on a, an extended period of creating, you know, new laws or regulations or something. So for, for, for many of the things we did in the, in the Fed in, in 2020, it was dealing with like, a, it's almost like an acute illness that you have to treat it right now and for the unique set of circumstances. However, there is good news on that as well because two of the, two of the things, well, I'll mention one really from the international context, is a recognition of, you know, partly because of the dollar's role in the international economy and dollar funding, you know, uh, how that works, is that not only, you know, have, you know, it has interna you know, international liquidity facilities we've had in the past been beneficial, but we've also made permanent our, our uh, FEMA, what's you know, FEMA repo facility is basically allowing central, you know, organizations who have uh, uh, securities with the Fed to be able to, to repo those in, in, in the future. So it was something we thought about for a long time. It's something that took a lot of work to prepare and get in place. It's now in place. It's, a, I think, a really important part of the liquidity uh, provision in the global uh, financial system. Obviously, domestically, we've also have the standing repo facility as well. So I think, you know, out of the lessons of the past uh, and also some of the experiences, we've, we've, we deal with some, we've dealt with some of the situations in a temporary way and some of them, you know, finding more permanent solutions that I think are, are supportive of the things you said. Go to the back middle, please. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Matthias Thiemann, Sciences Po Paris. I, I would have a short question on the interaction between financial stability considerations and monetary policy. And I wanted to ask about the reaction in March 2023. And my particular question is, do you think the uh, very determined intervention by the Fed that clarified that it will make sure that financial stability concerns are taken off the table have a, an encouraging effect on financial markets and in particular on those segments of financial markets that are offering credit and hence potentially uh, a contrary uh, impact to what you're trying to achieve with monetary policy namely cooling credit if i if i you see what i'm trying to get at so you're here. saying that the financial stability you 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 you're telling everybody uh, if it really gets bad, we'll make sure that nothing happens. And so everybody goes like, okay, well, then we can go on giving credit. Anyway, that, right. that's, the, uh, that's the idea. Ah, moral hazard. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, well, I, I th you know, moral hazard is something that we, th you know, obviously think, and take, think about a lot and take very seriously. And, and you also know, you have to be careful, this is, uh, it's not just a theoretical question, because in practice, you have to make the decisions that best serve the economy, the people, and, and, and the, kind of the future of the financial system. So to me, the answer on the moral hazard questions about do our actions that provide, whether an emergency action or other actions we do, do they somehow provide some kind of protection to people who take greater risks? 
is really making sure that we have the regulation, supervision, the reg, uh, you know, and laws that minimize uh, the vulnerabilities in our financial system. So people who take those extra risks end up suffering uh, or benefiting from taking those risks, but doesn't spread to the broader financial system. Again, I would go back to a lot of the financial, uh, the global financial crisis uh, reforms, uh, both in the U.S. but globally, obviously, and I think they were really uh, addressed at, at that. And that's that's how I how I think about this. So I think at the end of the day, uh, you know that I go back to March 2020 when basically liquidity in the most important. Uh, segment of the global financial system, the U.S. Treasury market, when, well, not liquidity, but the functioning of the most important core market in the world uh, was in question. You don't have a choice uh, about what to do. Uh, uh, you just have to restore that functioning because it spreads so quickly to the, to the rest of the markets and, and uh, the global financial system. So what, what, while we were going through that in spring of 2020, I think we always remind ourselves is we got to make sure that this doesn't happen again and what kind of reforms and other things need to be done to, to avoid that. Although when you're in a pandemic, you, you're hoping that you won't deal with that uh, situation again. Absolutely. Probably time for one or two more questions. Here we'll go front row here, or front section. So you mentioned that drawing lessons from the recent financial turmoil is an ongoing process. I was wondering if there are any that you've drawn already or that you could share with us. And I guess you could also, you, so you mentioned that the strength or the resilience of the regulation was one point that stood out, but you could also kind of look at the glass half empty and say that, you know, it took the coordinated action of, of a, and discretionary action of a number of bodies to prevent the financial system from toppling over. And that's not something you necessarily want to rely on going forward. So... Is the glass more fuller or emptier for you? Well, <laughs> it's a good question, and I, and I agree with the premise, right? There are, uh, you know, we were, uh, in many ways, we were focused on assuring, ensuring uh, that the largest institutions, the one that were, uh, it may be right at the center of the global financial crisis, were, uh, you know, bulletproof and resilient. And they, and of course, they've proven to be that uh, in, the, in, the, in 2020 and 2023, but making sure that, you know, the rest of the financial system, uh, including, you know, uh, regional banks and community banks are also uh, not, cannot contribute uh, uh, to, to broader financial stability vulnerabilities. I think it's clearly important, uh, a lesson of, of, of that episode. Um, if, you know, I, the way I think about this is uh, the financial system is always evolving and changing. And when we think about, uh, you know, the, what is the right set of regulations or the right set of, you know, kind of what are the principles that should be guiding us, we need to understand that whatever set of rules and whatever, you know, um, you know kind of constraints are put on the financial system, people are going to maximize against those constraints and it's going to evolve. And I think to me, you know, the fact that we didn't see these issues in the same way in the largest institutions or in many of the uh, smaller institutions is just, a, it's, it's also partly a reflection of how, you know, can, firms shifted their strategies or, or behavior around some of the, uh, uh, you know, what, what the, the constraints, what the rules were, and we have to just be aware of, of that. You know, and I don't know the answer to this question, uh, but if you think about the regulatory regime uh, in the, in, uh, that was put into place, it did make a very strong distinction between the largest institutions and smaller in institutions, and that changed over time. But I think to me, one of the lessons you know, from that, and without any specific conclusions, is having these kind of constraints that says, well, you're in this group and you're in that group, uh, maybe misses the fact that you really want to make sure that we're understanding what's happening in the groups that are moving in between or, 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 or transitioning. So that's, that's one of the, the um, kind of lessons I would take from that. So unfortunately, we have to leave it there. Um, but thank you so much for doing this, and thank you all for, for listening. Okay, so thank you, Colby. Thank you, John. Um, so John and all of us at the New York Fed invite you to join us at a reception. It's in the Liberty Room, which is on the first floor of this building. So our conference team is outside. They'll show you um, how to get down to the first floor of the building. Please take everything with you. You won't be able to come back up here to the auditorium. And so we'll both see you shortly downstairs, and we look forward to seeing many of you Thursday and Friday at Columbia University for the rest of the Seabra Conference. So thank you again. <laughs>